Okay, so Tim did a really great job of setting things up yesterday because he talked about these four things that get called entropy. He also talked about canon entropy, which I'm not going to talk about there. And he did a good job of emphasizing that these things are conceptually very different. And you might say, okay, is this like just a pun that they're all called entropy? Like, you know, sort of like, or it's just a bad choice of term terminology, like calling the stuff the Pizza Hut serves in America with what you get in a restaurant in Italy by the same word. <laughs> uh, which, you know, uh, so uh, what, I, what I want to say is, well, these guys all have, they're all conceptually different. They all have their uses. And they, there are relations between them. And so it's okay, it's important to keep them distinct in your mind, but also keep the relations between them in their mind, in your mind. And don't just, um, in some cases, you can use these guys interchangeably because under some circumstances, they will in fact be numeric, close to numeric, and they're equal to each other. But conceptually, they're different. So guess what we have them? I wrote the you know, how to ca recipe for calculating the, 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 the thing up here and the ingredients to go into the recipe. So if you want to know the thermodynamic entropy difference between the two thermodynamic states of a system, you imagine some thermodynamic reversible process that can, can, connects those states and you calculate the integral of the Heat, heat over temperature, where I'm ca calling, counting it a positive if heat's going into the system and negative if heat's going out of the system. And that allows you to calculate the entropy difference between any two thermodynamic states as long as they can be connected by some thermodynamic reversal process. So it doesn't have to be, have to be the case that they actually got there from, what, from, from, from thermodynamic, by thermodynamic reversal process. So, you know, you can consider free expansion. You, this is the example that Kim was using. You might imagine a gas initially confined to one half of a box. You pull up the partition. You let the thing um, equilibrate. That's not a thermodynamically reversible process. But if I want to know what uh, uh, the um, entropy difference between the initial and final state is, you, you cook up one. You cook up a thermodynamically reversible process that connects them. So if it's an ideal gas and this is isolated um, energy before and after is the same. Or, if it's isolated energy and before and after is the same, and if it's an ideal gas, temperature depends only on um, on energy. So temperature is same before and after. So if I want to kick up, think up a thermodynamic reversible process, I can imagine putting it in contact with a heat bath at that temperature and slowly expanding it, letting it do, um, you know, letting it do work. And since the energy is going to has to be constant, we have storming energy in from that heat bath. Heat energy is going into the thing, so crop. Um, DQ is positive, and un so unsurprisingly, the entropy difference between those states is positive. The latter state has a higher entropy. Okay. Um, so, ingredients to go in. I have to have a notion of thermodynamic state. I have to have a notion of temperature. I have to have a distinction between reversible and irreversible processes, and I have to have a distinction between these two modes of energy transfer as work and as heat in order to make sense of that. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is that um, as Tim emphasizes, emphasize, this distinction between work and heat doesn't belong to fundamental physics. I can say that even though I have only, I, I, even if I don't know what a fundamental physical theory would look like. I don't even know if the concept of energy will be part of a fundamental physical theory. Um, but even if it is, 
So the same thing in these two demanding modes of energy transfer has to do with okay, what sorts of things you can keep track and manipulate. And um, that's fine as long as we remember that we're not doing fundamental physics. It's perfectly okay to, to talk, say, okay, I've got a physical theory, and ask questions of, okay, do you got agents with certain abilities to manipulate what do certain kinds of, uh, of physical systems permit them to do? That's perfectly fine. Okay. Boltzmann entropy requires a partition of your phase space, and that's not part of your fundamental physics. Usually that has to do with the sort of macroscopic variables that you can deal with. It um, requires a measure on that space space, which is the um, new measure, um, which is the big measure with respect to canonical coordinates. Tim said this yesterday, and why you have to be exercised. Don't just call it the big measure. That's wrong. You will go to hell if you do that. <laughs> Seriously, God keeps keep track of these things. Um, the big measure is, as Tim pointed, a measure on R to the N. Now, a coordination of your phase space is a matching between R to N and, uh, um, and, 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 the, and the phase space. So, given a coordination, you can, you can um, define a big measure with respect to that coordination. And if you pick canonical coordinates, position of the, and, and the momenta, you get the Ugo measure, which, um, and one of the really neat things about that, it doesn't matter what canonical coordinates you use, it's invariant under canonical transformation. Okay. Okay. Um, Gibbs entropy is defined in terms of a um, probability distribution on phase space. Here, rho is the density function of, a, of that probability distribution with respect to the Ugo measure. A density is always a density with respect to some measure. And um, von, von Neumann, we've moved to, you know, this, this is classical. With von Neumann entropy, we've moved to um, quantum mechanics. You've got a system with which you associate a Hilbert space, and a general state of the system can be represented by a, a density operator on that Hilbert space. And um, that's um, the definition of, um, of von Neumann entropy. So what do these things got to do with each other? That's what I'm going to talk about. So, um, Is there a way to set this so it doesn't go to sleep while I'm talking? Um, I think it did, you know, it didn't under PowerPoint on how to do this. It didn't under PowerPoint, but I guess that's what knows that it's doing right. something. I, I don't know. Or maybe we'll just try to pretend we're poking every few minutes. Uh, I have such a good task for this. Okay. All right. Okay. So I want to talk about the relations be, um, be, be, uh, between them. And particularly, um, if I just write it like this, these guys look like they're kind of coming out of nowhere. Right? And you might say, well, why, why might anyone think there's any relation to, 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 to these? But there's a rationale for them. There's a method to this madness. What, can, can I ask you a question? Can you say something about using that formula in the two different contexts in which density operators occur, namely you know, proper mixtures and... and okay, very good. Yeah. When is it appropriate to use and where? When is it? Yeah, so, yeah, right, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, uh, Dana pointed out that uh, there's two kinds of circumstances in which a mixed density, you can use a mixed state in, in quantum mechanics. One is if you've got a subsystem of a bigger system and you've got a pure state for the bigger system, but you're restricting your attention to the subsystem. If that subsystem is entangled with the rest of the system, the restriction to the subsystem will be a mixed state. And the other use of it is that, well, you might have some process that produces some pure state, but you're not quite sure which it is, what, what pure state the, um, the, the, the system is actually in. 
Yeah. And I just, yeah. I just yeah. mentioned. Yeah. It also might be nothing to do with ignorance. You just have an ensemble and there's a statistical, there's a statistical fact about right. how the ensemble is. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Right. And the two are related because if I now just pick one at random at, 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 at the ensemble, I won't know which one. Right. right. Have, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, we use these density operators in cases where um, it's where we've got a pure state of the whole, whole system when we're restricting our attention to some subset of its degrees of freedom, and when there's some pure state which is imperfect, imperfectly known. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I think for the purposes, well, for for the purposes, for our purposes, it's not going to matter too much. Um, and here's why. Um, I mean, in one case, in one case, you're already counting something clear, right? For instance, in the, right. in the way right. in, 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 in the way being described, it's clear what you're counting. Right. In this other way, where you're simply, I don't know what you're counting. Yeah, so that would be a worry if we were doing fundamental physics. But we're not. When you're going to see how I introduce these things. And it's going to have to do with um, um, this sort of considerations I was talking about here involving work and heat. And it's going to be a way of keep, keeping track of how much energy you can extract as, as work. So. Here's why I think it doesn't matter too much, and you may disagree, but you know, maybe we'll have, we'll, we'll have the rest of this discussion later. Uh, because if that's what you're thinking, if you're thinking I'm not doing fundamental physics, if you're thinking you're talking about what their agents with certain means of manipulation can do with a system, then one of the things you might count as a resource is knowledge of the system. What the agent knows about a system is relevant. Um, so, you know, you know, if you give me um, two heat baths at different temperatures and, and, and say run a heat engine between them, well, you have to, first of all, in order to actually extract to, to know what to do, you're going to have to know that they're at different temperatures and which one's hotter and which one's colder and things like that. So when we're working out working at this level, not fundamental physics, I, it's at least not prima facie obvious that concepts like knowledge are irrelevant. Are irrelevant. Uh, so, um, and that's important because I think that um, what happens a lot is people will confuse different areas of, of, of discourse. So um, surely everyone in this room has read Bell's Against Measurement. Their Bell rants against using certain, you know, certain concepts he says do not belong in um, fundamental physics and measurement. One of them, I would say, you know, among other things are knowledge, um, yeah, um, belief, etc. Et you know, those aren't part of fundamental physics. But if I'm, and if I'm not engaged in that, so if I'm engaged in a process talking about, well, okay, what does the physics let agents that have certain resources do? Then um, concepts of knowledge are not really into that. So here's why I say it might not matter. Um, so. Um, Suppose I give you a, a, a system and I tell you a, um, you know, here's a density operator for the system. And I say, you're allowed to manipulate that system and not anything else. You know, what can you do with it? And you ask me, well, okay, tell me what, whether this is a proper or improper mixture. And, you know, um, is the system entangled with in a pure, you know, in an entangled pure state with this environment, or did Wayne, did you flip a coin and prepare some pure state in certain probabilities? 
Um, I can tell you the answer to that, and I actually think that the, I actually do think that those are physically distinct situations. But in terms of prob probabilities of the outcome of any experiment that you can do on that system, it won't matter. And that includes doing certain manipulations, maybe connecting it to another system, and um, and then you know doing an experiment to find out what the result of that operation was. So I mean, when, when you say probabilities there, yeah. I guess you mean credences. That is probabilities insofar as as we could as yeah. we're in a position to Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Or, or right. expected long term frequencies if you do it over and over. Right. Or expected right. long term frequencies. Right. Yeah. Can, right. can I can I make an unorthodox suggestion? Yes. I, I prepared just like four slides on right. bundling yeah. energy. Right. And you you sort of started into it. Maybe a, can I just interrupt you and do my four slides for people who are unfamiliar because I think it might be helpful? Or are you not really going to go into the one? I'm going to do it later. Well, you want to do your four slides? Let, let me do my four slides. I, I, I honestly, I will. Okay. I'll, I'll do this very quickly just because yeah. I, I can imagine there are people who haven't done this. Yeah, because I was and planning on talking to you about the, the conversation is now evolving in a way that long people can know what, what's going on. Right. It might not be everything. So let me just uh, let me let, let me just do this little tiny presentation. Just a moment in the meanwhile, way you you lost me at the point where you said you're supposed to manipulate the system and nothing else. I don't understand that because in order to manipulate the system, I have to use something else. Okay, what I mean what I mean is you've got your so. All right, you've got the system in your app, and you've got your and you've got certain other. So I didn't say it quite right. You've got certain other systems that you have access to, but you don't have access to. So if it's a prop, proper mixture, you don't have access to the, the, the thing it's entangled with. Improper. 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 If it's improper, you don't. You don't get to touch that. Yeah. Yeah. If it is improper mixture, you don't get to touch the thing that's entangled. But that's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. So let me just do this again. I, I, I'll just do it really quickly. I just want to make sure everybody's up to speed. So um, with von Neumann, all right, I can't get that. Much. That's okay. So uh, you know, with Gibbs, you give me a probability measure of the space which has a measure, um, so you can integrate. This is what just what Wayne mentioned that the, uh, our probability density is always well. You know, you see space that has a, a, a measure against which you can integrate. And, and then from a Gibbsian point of view, you can define this thing. I mean, what it, what it means physically and so on could be an open question. You can define it. But von Neumann, as you can see, just kind of takes the same minus k trace rho log rho, very same mathematical formula, and sticks the density matrix in. OK? So you've defined, again, you've defined something. Uh, uh, and so then we have the guy left out the K. Right. Well, we want to trace there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, right, I should take the trace. Now, what properties does this, does this particular thing have? Uh, right. So if you're in a pure state, mm -hmm. which means rho squared equals rho, um, then you've essentially kind of concentrated, if you're thinking in terms of probability measures and you're thinking of Hilbert space as the space of possible states, you concentrated your measure all on one state. I mean, this is like we were saying, if there are two possible states, A and B, but the probability of A is one and the probability of B is zero, right? Then, then the Gibbs entropy goes to zero. I did that last time. And the same thing here. If you concentrate all the probability on one Hilbert space, which means you're in a pure state, then the von Neumann entropy is going to be zero. And it will, because pure states evolve into pure states under Hamiltonian evolution, it's always going to be zero. So this entropy cannot increase. Even though the initial state might be a pure state that intuitively describes a glass of water with a half-melted ice cube, 
and under Hamiltonian evolution, it evolves into a pure state that describes a state thermodynamic equilibrium. The von Neumann entropy will not budge an inch under that evolution. So one thing we know is that this thing is, its connections to thermodynamic entropy are at least not obvious, right? If they exist at all. I mean, you really need to think hard. It, 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 and this is where I find physicists often just throw the ground right. back and forth. Right. And, you know, and say, oh, here I've calculated the Van Neumann entropy, now I'm going to draw some thermodynamic consequences. Right. And you say, no, 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 you're not, right? Or at least not. Well, I don't say that, because I'm going to tell you about the big Okay, the, 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 I mean, maybe that's setting up the yeah. problematic. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. Um, and again, that's true, right? This fact that this won't change. And it, it could remind you a little bit, as we said, also of the fact that the Gibbs entropy does not change right. under Hamiltonian evolution, right? If you coarse grain it, you can get it to change, but the coarse grain is not a Hamiltonian evolution. So, you know, uh, uh, all right, that's what I just said, and so it doesn't change at all. Now, it has this property, and this is relevant to Daniel's point about improper mixtures, which is what I want to talk about here. This funny property called subadditivity, which I don't know how, you know, it's not that common a term, and you have to be doing this stuff to even bump into it. Um, so suppose I have a system, and I, and it's a complex system, and I can divide it into subsystems in some way, right? I can take, and usually you just do a bipartite, if you imagine tripartite, whatever, bipartite is enough, of course, because by a sequence of bipartite things, you can keep chopping it up. So suppose I have a system, and in some way I can think of it as, as having two subsystems in it. Um, if you're doing Boltzmann entropy, you just can't have a situation where you would say, gee, the entropy of the large system is less than the entropy of the constituent subsystems, right? I mean, the volume in phase space that's occupied uh, relevant to the whole system has to be bigger than, than the subsystems. Uh, so that, you know, you would just say you made a mistake if you think something like that can happen from a Boltzmannian point of view. But uh, let's just take the simplest case, the two-particle system in a singlet state, singlet spin state. Um, so that's a pure state, so the von Neumann entropy of the complete system is zero. But if I consider, and this is what, you know, if I only have in my hand one of the two electrons, and the other one is locked away somewhere, and I can't manipulate it, it's out of my reach, and I want to make predictions about that one electron concerning observables that pertain only to it, so nothing about correlations, then I use a reduced density matrix, right? I trace over the other guy. And I end up with a reduced density matrix for this one electron that has the property that if I measure spin in any direction, it's 50-50, right? Which is something no pure state can give me, right? Every pure state for electron A in the spin space will be an eigenstate in some direction, right? But the reduced density matrix isn't. And, and again, I don't know how many people know this, but this reduced density matrix we get by tracing out is the same one we would use if you said, oh, here's an electron. It was either prepared Z spin up or Z spin down, but I flipped a coin. Or it was either prepared X spin up or X spin down, but I flipped a coin. Or Y spin up or Y spin down. I mean, all these different preparations that would prepare, have prepared a pure state, but you don't know which. And then you weight the possibilities by these probabilities. These are different statistical ensembles, but they're all described by the same density matrix, which means no experiment you could do on such an ensemble will tell you which preparation it was. The statistical results will be the same. OK. So the Subsystem is not in a pure state, and it's von Neumann, right? The, the single electron is not in a pure state. It's described by its density matrix. Its von Neumann entropy is not zero, 
And in fact, the singlet state is going to maximize the unemployment entropy of the individual particles. It's going to, you know, because you're, as it were, maximally uncertain, you might say, about the results of spin measurements, no matter which one you do, it's just 50-50. It actually maximizes the unemployment entropy. So you have this funny situation. I mean, we understand how it came about, but you just have to be aware this happens. Each particle individually is in a maximal entropy state, and the pair of particles taken together is in a minimal entropy state. And uh, generally, you can ask this, and this is often done in the literature, I have a system, think of all the possible partitionings of it, and do a, you know, a extremization over all the possible partitions. Um, and you'll get that the sum of the entropies of the parts is always greater than or equal to the entropy of the whole. So it's kind of, uh, it's actually like the triangle inequality in a certain way, but it's also the opposite of what you'd intuitively expect, right? It exactly flips around what your naive expectation should be. Um, now, and this is, this is my last slide, so I really said this would be clear. Um, if you're in a product state and there's zero entanglement, that's the situation where the von Neumann entropy of the whole is just the sum of the parts. Therefore, when, when you get this proper subadditivity, when, the, when, when it's the, the entropy of the whole is less than the sum of the entropy of the parts, that's an indication you've got entanglement. And therefore, in a way, you've got a measure of entanglement that's going to go to zero for the products. Uh, and therefore, you can see how this is going to allow for the definition of something we call the entanglement entropy. Because the more entanglement there is, the more the sum of the entropies exceeds the entropy of the sum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, it, and it, in a product state, the entanglement entropy is zero. And the, I just wanted people to see these are the definitions. Once you have the definitions, you just apply them, you get these results. Um, people are going crazy talking about entanglement entropies and quantifying entanglement entropies. And this is how you do it, and there's nothing obscure about the math. What's obscure is for sure what the hell entanglement entropy has to do with thermodynamics which people make assumptions all the time when they're talking about black hole entropies and the information loss paradox. And when they're doing the information loss paradox, and they throw in the Shannon entropy, the pilot of Pelion and also. So anyway, I, I mean, I, I hope this, I, I just felt like the discussion was presupposing right. that I knew all this and maybe not everybody else. Okay. That was the, yeah, that was it, is the two features that you mentioned um, one, that it is preserved under Hamiltonian evolution, and two, the sub -adivity. those are going to be important later on. Yeah, okay. And so, yeah, and, and so I agree entirely with what, um, what Tim said, is this, this, these things have nothing obviously to do with that. And actually, I would say these three things have nothing obviously to do with that. Right. Um, but they do have something to do with it. And so one thing I want to make sure we get through is we get, we get through the answer to the question, what have these guys got to do with the thermodynamic en entropy? So at a certain point, if it, if it appears that the interesting discussions are going to go on too much, I'm going to say let's put a pause on that. I want to make sure everybody in this room knows by the end of when we're talking what the relation between these things are and the throwing the net entropy is. Yeah. Well it just and this may be something to delay for later on, okay. but it just picks up on what Tim was saying. There seems to be a way in which the von Neumann entropy stands out <clears throat> in the sense that it's it, it's it's it seems like it's easy to think of cases of processes in which the von Neumann entropy is going up and the thermodynamic entropy is going down. Um, am I right in thinking that? And, and, that and, and cases like that are at least less obvious in the case of Boltzmann. Uh, I mean, in the case of Boltzmann, they think they don't exist. In the case of Gibbs, if they do exist, they're less obvious. In the von Neumann case, 
it really seems just on the face of it like there's a question. Because you can imagine the the you know the Boltzmann and the, the quantum mechanical Boltzmann entropy, whatever that turned out to be, and the thermodynamic entropy going down, even in cases where where the system is becoming as as the thermodynamic entropy is going down, more entangled with some other system. Um, yes. Mm. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So I want to, so maybe I say something um, to, to start with, um, to, to where I'm going. Okay, thermodynamic entropy as ordinarily defined in thermodynamics um, applies only to equilibrium states. Um, Boltzmann entropy is, is defined even out, of equal, uh, even out of the equilibrium. And one of the things that Boltzmann used this is increase of this as tracking pro right. progress towards equilibrium. And um, unless you've got a notion of, of thermic of, of, of um, entropy outside of equilibrium, you can't use that to track progress towards equilibrium. Um, so um, I'm not going to argue that uh, the use of this is track of either one of these things is tracking progress towards equilibrium. I'm going to I'm going to talk about the use that they have, but that is not going to be the use. Can I just make sure I understand right? So let me rephrase what I just said. Yeah. It feels like I could define two equilibrium states, right? Such that the thermodynamic entropy of A is higher than the thermodynamic entropy of B. Right. But such that the von Neumann entropy of A is lower than the von Neumann entropy of B. Um, yes, you can. Okay. Okay. Um, so what's so you're imagining a case where you've got a pure state which is which is e e evolving in such a way that the von Neumann. I, I'm imagining a case like this. Um, um, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, I contrast the following two states right. of a gas, right. okay? One, it's a, it's a pure state, okay? Right. But of high thermodynamic and Boltzmannian entropy. Okay. Right. It's dispersed throughout okay. the right. Yeah. right. Okay? Second, second state, okay? Right. Um, the gas and this, the gas particles in this container are entangled right. with with other physical right. degrees of freedom right. outside of it. Right. But the gas particles are in fact all in one corner of right. the container. So the Boltzmann and thermodynamic entropies are lower, but the von Neumann entropy, which used to be zero, right. is now higher. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, so um, here's what I want to, to, to um, say, say about that. Um, so in the first case, you've got something that looks macroscopically, it is thermal equal, macroscopically thermal equilibrium, it's a pure state that the gap particles are all spread out. Right. right. Okay, so that has, if you've got a pure state, that has zero one in it. Right. Okay. Um, here's what I think. If you think of, okay, the quantity I want is going to tell me something about what I can do about that thing, then there's a big difference between that pure state and one that it might have unitarily evolved out of, which might have been all the particles on half of the box, right? Because the, the, you know, the, the, the fir first one that I can be extracted right. work from, right? right. And that's because even though you, know, you don't think, here's the way I, I, I want to think about this. Um, you've got this system and it's got this full set of degrees of freedom. Among those degrees of freedom are ones that you can manipulate and then there's the rest. So I can actually think of that system. You know, uh, you know suppose I've got a set of things that I, 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 that I can manipulate and the rest and they, and they commute with each other. I can write the state of that system as a tensor product of, of state for these degrees of freedom and these degrees of freedom. And if these are the ones that I'm manipulating, those are the ones that 
re are relevant to the question, what can I get out of it? Right. Then what I want to do is look at the state of that. So, and, and that would be a, a mixed state. Remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Right, and so, um, so when you're uh, talking about, um, I think it's a bit, um, okay, so let me just, um, um, step back, step back, back a bit. By the way, um, a lot of what I'm saying today is in a paper that is, I recently put on the Phil Psych archive called Explaining Thermodynamics. So if you look for that, so if you can right there. Um, I actually think that um, there's an important distinction between these kinds of considerations of thermodynamics that have to do with, 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 um, with the um, distinction between work and heat and the interesting and important um, issue of explaining relaxation towards equilibrium. Um, and it's not obvious, and, 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 and then, because that, um, um, that latter project, you know, that has to do with what things do when we're leaving them alone and we're not manipulating them. Right? Um, so um, I think that some, you bring it's different. You ought to bring. I feel perfectly content to bring conceptual tools to this discussion of thermodynamic entropy that we to be totally out of place in explaining equilibration. But when you are dealing with equilibration, and so if you don't think that, and, and if you think that the evolution is unitary, if you don't think that some kind of stochastic process is going on, then. Okay, um, if there's a state of the universe, it is evolving unitarily. Um, but what you're doing when you're, and that's, and that actually raises a kind of a puzzle because um, the um, process of equilibrium. So the thing about unitary evolution is it preserves distinguishability of states. It, you know, the, so if, if I have, you know. Psi of t is some. Um, right, if, if, if I have the same evolution and um, I, I apply it to two different initial states, then that evolution will preserve the inner product of these things. If, if I start out with orthogonal states, they'll end up with orthogonal. Now, if you think about the process of equilibration, characteristic of it is that very different initial states end up in the same final state. It's hard, you know, if we're talking about macroscopic states. So if I were to um, have a, put a cup of water in this room and leave it, this, leave, leave it here all day so that at the end of the day it's a room temperature, and I ask you, okay, do experiments on that cup of water and tell me whether at 10 a.m. it was ice water or boiling water. You can't do it. Different. So there's this, then there's this apparent paradox. We want to explain equilibration using unitary evolution. Unitary evolution preserves this distinguishability of states in the, in the whole, and the characteristic of equilibration is it merges. But when yeah yeah let me let me just finish okay right. sure um, now that's true if you're talking about the full state of the system right now if I restrict my attention to a limited set of degrees of freedom of the, of, of the system the um, say the macroscopic variables then the evolution of those variables is not unitary. It does not prefer to preserve distinguishability. And so if I were looking for something that um, I could use to track process progress to equil equilibrium, it would definitely not be this where we're always taking over the full set of degrees of freedom. It could be 
this where we're always restricted to a subset of the degrees of freedom. And for that, the entropy can increase. But yeah. Uh, so, I'm not so you might say, what? So you might say, what the heck good is this? And I, and I, I want to answer that question. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. But I, I, I'm just, I have confusion at a more fundamental level. Okay, right. Okay. So I want to ask a question where I'm going to be careful, where, where, that has nothing to do with equilibration, right? nothing to do with dynamical evolution right. at all. Okay. Consider two equilibrium states right. of, a, of a gas. Okay. Mm -hmm. One, uh, you know, the gas is in a box. Um, right. These are both equilibrium states, right. but one is higher temperature than the other. Right. Okay, good. But it's perfectly consistent with the claim that one has higher temperature than the other. Yes. Okay? That is, say that the expectation value of the kinetic energy is, is higher than one, uh, in, is higher in one than in the other. Yes. Okay? It's perfectly consistent with that for it to be the case that the lower temperature, that, that, that the higher temperature state is a pure state right. of the particles in yes. the gas, and in the lower temperature state, the particles in the gas are entangled with other degrees of freedom yes. outside of the gas. Yes. Okay? Good. Claim, if I understand things correctly, right. um, in the, in, as I just described it, Yes. The higher temperature state will, of course, have higher thermodynamic and Boltzmann entropy yes. than the lower uh, temperature state. Yes. But the lower temperature state will have higher von Neumann entropy yes. than the higher temperature yes. state. So this has nothing to do with tracking right. equilibration. This has nothing to do with dynamics at right. all. Even for equilibrium states, they can make inverted assignments of entropy. Yes. Okay, okay, good. Yes. Good. good. So that just sharpens the question, what the hell use good. could there be? That's, I just wanted to make sure I yeah. understood that. Excellent. Yeah. Thank, I'm sorry I, I yeah. waited. No, that, 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 that's, that's, that's fine. So, so, so yeah, so, um, so yeah, so what the hell are these guys by Neumann and Gibbs, um, contrary to what you might think, that, that would people probably have neither of them or morons, what, what, why would they actually introduce this? Uh, 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 there is a use for such things, and there is a relation between these things and the thermodynamic entropy, and I want to get to that. So, uh, right, so here's what the plan. We're still on the first part. I definitely want to get, get to, this is my answer to, to the relation of these things, thermodynamic entropy, because they aren't just pulled out of, of the air. Um, they have a role to play. Um, and then um, talk about the relation of Boltzmann entropy to Gibbs entropy, and then the relation of Boltzmann entropy to thermodynamic entropy. Because, okay, as long as you're thinking qual qualitatively, it's intuitively plausible that this is increasing when the thermodynamic entropy is increasing. Or, but, are we going to have numerical equality between these, or approximate numerical equality to these? And I think it's actually important to, to talk about the circumstances under which we, we do have approximate numerical equality between those. All right. OK. So just refreshing everyone's memory, um, class in thermodynamics starts with the analysis of the Carnot cycle. Kelvin and Clausius both um, got, they started talking about these, the, the, these things. As Ken talked about yesterday, a Carnot cycle is a, all you know, it's a reversal engine that is um, operating between um, two heat baths of, uh, of different temperatures. And as long as you think um, that, um, it's not possible to, say, move heat from a colder heat bath, to, uh, sorry, to, to a hotter one without doing any work, then you conclude that there's a limit to, um, um, to how much um, energy I can get out of this thing. And um, so I have a higher heat bath at a higher temperature T1, Keep at the lower temperature, temperature um, T2. Carnot's analysis is if, if, if I pull out a certain amount of heat out of the hotter heat bath, 
use it to lift a, a weight or something like, the, like, like that. This, you know, discard some of the cooler, keep that. Um, there's, that. There's a limit to how much I can work in the I can get per heat extracted. This is familiar to everyone, I think. And, um, and here, the work done is just the difference between the heat that I pull out and the heat that I, I dump in. And more generally, if I have any process where I operate my system in the cycle, returning to the same thermal dynamic that I started with. If I can't heat going into the system as positive and going out to the system as negative, then this, this will have to happen and with equality when it's a reversible process. Okay, this is familiar, right? Okay. Um, so that, that's so far that, that, that's fair enough. And, um, because this has to be zero around any reversible cycle, that means that you can um, define a, a um, state function, a function that depends only on the thermodynamic state, such that um, this is all. This is always always true and. Um, Equality for reversible process. Yes. Can you clarify the difference if something is a state function, not a state function? I mean, what is the, the physical uh, meaning? Yeah, the, the state function depends only on the currents that throw it out, state, not how you got there. Right. So, um, yeah. My state is I'm standing, stand, standing here. I can get there from different ways. Right. Um, and. Importantly, it depends only on the thermodynamic state, on the thermodynamic variables. So no one thinks that, so there's lots of ways to produce a glass of water at room temperature. No one thinks that there's a unique microstate that um, corresponds to that macrostate. A different way to gain that macrostate may, 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 might make a difference to the microstate, but it doesn't make a difference for the thermodynamic state. Yeah, so what I mean is to be a, to, to be a um, state fu function of the thermodynamic state is, if I tell you what the thermodynamic state is, I can, um, I can tell you what that quantity is. I don't have to tell you about the microstate, and I don't even have to tell you about the history of it. Okay? Good. All right, okay. Okay, now, one thing that Tim talked about this before is once people start thinking about statistical mechanics in relation to thermodynamics, they realize that the laws of thermodynamics as originally formulated could not be strictly true. And the familiar story that I think everyone has, has, has heard, which um, still, um, is presented by the Air Fests in their, in their lovely little encyclopedia article, is about Boltzmann's realization of that. So the story goes that 1872, formula, Boltzmann formulates his H theorem. That H, by the way, is probably a capital eta. Yes, it is. Right. But don't go call, around calling it the eta theorem because no one will know what you mean. You know, everyone calls it the H theorem. Right. Um, so it kind of looks like what he did there is he demonstrated on the basis of mechanics alone that a, a gas will, that's originally doesn't have a maximum ultimate distribution of velocities will monotonically converge to one that does. And then Loschmidt says, well, hold on, wait, that can't possibly be true. Because the dynamics you're using is time reversal invariant. So if there are states that lead towards equilibrium, there's also states that lead away from equilibrium. And most of the response is, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, it's not clear. There's debate in the literature about whether, whether Boltzmann knew this in 1872 and wasn't explicit about it, uh, or he actually realized this in light of what Boltzmann said. But he did say, yeah, you're right. Any attempt to prove from the nature of bodies and the laws of interaction forces exist that that's the formula I had on the thing must be in vain. And then, you know, what he said um, is, 
What I'm talking about is the most probable um, behavior. And there is a discussion um, in the in, in letters um, to Nature in 1895 with, uh, with someone that um, asked, "Can someone please tell me what the H theorem proves?" And Boltzmann eventually wrote in, and he said, "What I proved my paper is false." It's extremely probable that H is very near to its minimum value. If it's greater, it may increase or decrease, but the probability it decreases is always greater. Um, H is the negative of what we call it. Um, um, the, the quantity that Clausius originally, um, the, the quantity of Clausius eventually called energy changed its sign from one paper to another because, he's, because the convention about whether heat going into the system is positive or negative changed. Um, so, you still can, you know, as long as you know what convention is being um, in operation at a given time, you're fine. Okay, so it's only an average value. It doesn't always hold. So, like, so he's also acknowledging that, okay, um, it'll probably probably decrease, but if you wait long enough, it might increase. Yeah, it might in increase a bit, but yeah, on average. Now, all that was right, um, but that leaves out part of the story in that um, Boltzmann was kind of late to the party in all this because the British um, physicists who were working on this realized that the artifact, the reversibility of argument. The first appearance in writing is in, eight, in 1868. Um, there was a letter that Maxwell wrote to Tate where um, Maxwell tells Tate about the um, Maxwell demon. And then someone wrote on that in pencil, very good, and another way to see this would be to reverse the velocities of everything and preside over the subsequent evolution. And when that letter was first um, reprinted in the um, Life of Tate, the editor um, ascribed it to Kelvin. Um, a more recent group of um, 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 scholars who um, edited Maxwell's um, collect collected papers say they think the handwriting looks more like Tate's. So the reversibility argument is due either to Back to Kelvin or Tate, who, whoever wrote it. Um, and this is Maxwell accumulate, uh, 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 communicating it to um, um, Lord Rayleigh. Due to is a kind of funny word. What's that? To say the argument is due to, I mean, maybe one of those guys got there first, but everybody else got there independently. It's not like, oh, oh. it doesn't take a lot okay. of insight. For this to right. occur to you. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah so cer certainly motion is probably, you know, you know yeah, it, it doesn't take a lot of insight. So, yeah, I do think that um, various people realize this independently. Yeah. Right, right. Did I say due to? You did say due to. Okay. Right. All right, okay. Originally written yeah. out by. First person to write that. Right. So I, I love this. Um, Beer strap. And there's no, hi, how are you? <laughs> how are like the kids or yeah. something like that? <laughs> If this world is purely a purely dynamical system and if you accurately reverse the motion of every particle at the same instant, then all things will happen backwards to the beginning of things. The rain drops will collect themselves from the ground and fly to the cloud, etc. And then we'll see their friends. Um, oh no, I have to do it from memory. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I, I like this so much I actually ought to have it memorized. Um, um, so, okay. Um, all right, there we go. Um, Men will see their friends passing through the grave to the cradle to we ourselves become the reverse of boring, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> we shall then speak of the impossibility of knowing about the past except by analogies taken from the future. But, but I do not think it requires such a defeat, defeat to upset the second law of the events. And then he tells. Um, Really about the demon, and as as moral, the second law of thermodynamics has the same degree of truth as the statement that if you throw a tumbler full of water into the sea, you cannot get the same tumbler full of water out again. And what he's trying to say, like, what he's conveying there is, it's not impossible according to the laws of physics, but it's not at all the sort of thing that you would expect to happen. Right? It's very improbable. Right? Um, so.
So, um, the, yeah, that was statement, he, he explicitly talks about probability, that's what I want there. Um, Gibbs, I think, probably independently came to the same conclusion. Gibbs is thinking about mixing with gases, the thing that um, uh, Tim was talking about. When gases in the mix, there's no more possibility of separating the two kinds of molecules in version of their ordinary motions in the gaseous mass without external neighboring. Then there is the separation of a homogeneous gas in the same two parts into which it's going to be divided after they've been once mixed. Well, he's actually there talking about the entropy of mixing, which we were talking about. The impossibility of an uncompensated degrees of entropy seems to be reduced to a probability. Okay, so the, re the reason I put these quotes up is that all these guys, when they're thinking about the status of the second law of, of thermodynamics, they're thinking, okay, the sort of thing that the, the original formulation of the second law of thermodynamics deemed impossible is not impossible, but it's improbable. And so that suggests that we are going to have to bring in considerations of probability. Okay. And if we think about the fact that the gases, the, the, the things we're dealing with are made of molecules bouncing around, um, on any um, given run of a Carnot engine, we might get more work than the Carnot method. But then, then we might get less. And the idea is we can't predictably, reliably get more work than the, the current Carnot method which suggests that we're going to want to look for something in terms of expectation value of, of, um, of, of what we're seeing. And in his dissertation in 1920-something, um, Sillard um, talks about this analogy of possibility of a gambling, gambling system. So Las Vegas is full of people who have schemes for beating the, the house, and if the, if the games actually work as advertised, um, those schemes have negative expectation value. So they might win for a while, but as Tim said, in the long run, with probability one, they're going to lose. So that's the sort of thing we're going to be looking for. Okay. So what I want to do is actually show you a, a, a theorem of that type about the expectation value of heat obtained in the cycle and Dr. Tectification values work obtained in the cycle, given a probability distribution over the initial state of the systematic and heat baths. Now that raises an interesting and important question. What is the status of this probability distribution? The theorem itself will not depend on what the meaning of the probability is, but our understanding of the theorem certainly will. So, um, and that's characteristic of theorems of probability in general. There's, there are different senses of the word probability, but if you're actually just doing a homework problem in a probability class, it doesn't matter which one um, you're thinking about because the theorem tool for, for all of them. So what I'd like to do is get to the actual theorem and then talk about, well, what could this probability um, uh, mean? So but basically, um, yeah. We're going to start out, basically, we're going to start out with a probability distribution over the initial states of everything and let you run the cycle and calculate, given that initial probability distribution, probabilities of work extracted and, 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 and heat extracted and get the corresponding, and, you know, punchline is, um, we're, we're going to get that with expectation values um, around the queues. Um, great. And then, of course, it's, it, it's important to talk about um, um, what, what this means. And I think, this, I think that um, statistical mechanics shares with quantum mechanics um, something that's both a nice feature and also unfortunate. In both, in, in both um, subjects, you can learn to do calculations without much of a clue of what, you, what it is physically that you, you, you're doing. Which is good because if you, 
you know, we wish we want to give these physicists their degree, their degrees, and if they had that understanding what they're doing, they'd never get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you have to be able to pass the course, and now if you pass the course, you have to do the homework problems. Right, but, but also, I can actually do that in a somewhat serious way. It is actually interesting and important that um, it's important. It, you can actually do lots of interesting and productive work with very confused ideas about the foundations of, 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 of the subject. And, um, you know, so, right, so anyways. Now, one thing, interesting thing about this subject is that um, the actual mathematical facts that I'm going to be using um, don't depend sharp, um, on whether I'm doing it in classical called context or the quantum context. So there's totally analogous things. And some, um, I don't think any introductory textbooks do this, but there are some statistical mechanics textbooks which employ this kind of dual notation that says, okay, we're going to write down all these, these, these formula. And these formulas are shorthand for two very different equations, one classical and one quantum. And the interesting thing is you can go an awful way with that. So in what follows, I'm going to use rho without a hat to be either a density function on a classical state space or else a quantum density operator. I'll put a hat on it when I want to emphasize it as a density operator. We can see the expectation value with respect to rho is either of something. There's either an expectation value of a function on phase space with respect to that probability distribution, or it's, you know, f is an operator representing some um, physical quantity and you're taking the trade. Right? So everyone's familiar with the, this use of density operators. So I think that's, that's basically why they get introduced, is allows you to calculate uh, probabilities. And please see that, that um, Tim uh, um, used the word Hamiltonian evolution in his um, slide on Voinona entropy. So Hamiltonian evolution will mean um, either state evolution according to Hamiltonian's equation of motion or um, quantum unitary evolution. Okay, good? All right. Okay. Now, in this context, how do I represent the distinction between work and geek? Because um, the point of view of the classic quantum physics, there's just a state of something that's evolving. Now, if you think about it, um, you know, none of this is going to be um, Restricted to the, 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 the um, case of a gas in the box, but that's always a nice a, a, a example because it's nice and practical. So, you know, here's a um, system gas in the box, and I might be able to raise and lower a weight. You know, I can just treat this whole thing as a physical system and apply Hamiltonian evolution up to it. Or I can say, no, I'm going to apply my Hamiltonian evolution just to the gas in the box, and the position of this pin piston is going to be, be an external constraint on, it, 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 uh, on, on the system that is going to show up in the Hamiltonian. So I'm going to treat, so I'm going to treat the, the, um, the um, position of the position as something that I'm not actually applying the, 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 laws of the equations of motion to, and just say, okay, I'm going to exogenously give that as uh, as, a, as a parameter of the Hamiltonian, and so that and it could be um, yeah, so. We're going to do that, and we're also going to assume that you've got available um, various heat beds, which are things that you're not going to do any um, work on or extract, uh, or, or aren't going to do any work 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 on. You're just going to exchange um, heat with them. But when you treat as a, as a parameter in the Hamiltonian, it's going to be very hard to represent somehow entanglement that curve can occur as, uh, as a result of your manipulations between the Right, gas so what I'm going to do, yeah, so what I'm going to do is, if I'm doing this quantum way, I'm going to write down a quantum state for the gas, 
treat all of this as something with a definite value that I just set. And therefore, I'm, you know, if I were to treat the whole system quantum mechanically, what's going to happen is the gas gets entangled with the position of the wave. Right? I'm going to disregard that. I'm going to treat the, the position of weight as a classical variable that has a definite value. How can I get away with that? That's a very, you know, can I get away with that? Right? Presumption. And if so, how is a very deep question of the interpretation of, um, of quantum mechanics. But um, I think that it's a, a question that um, every interpretation of, of, of quantum mechanics really ought to give the answer, yes, I can get away with that. So um, when you do experiments on a system, yes, we know that um, the um, experimental apparatus and we ourselves are all quantum si si systems. But when you do an experiment, you treat the experimental parameters as ex exogenous variables, um, effectively free for the purpose at hand, as a great man once said. So yeah, I'm just going to flag that that's what I'm doing. Um, and um, interesting, we can have an interesting discussion about how I might be able to get away with that, but let's defer that. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, as I said, we're going to start out with probability distributions over the um, initial states of things. Um, there are arguments which I, I, I'm going to postpone for now. Because, um, to the effect that if you have a thermalized system, something that's relaxed to thermal equilibrium, um, the, uh, the appropriate um, probability distribution is the canonical distribution. Let me just say briefly what the argument is. is the idea is that this system is um, one that you can't do um, any um, work on or, or get any work out of. And um, basically that means that um, um, you can't lower the expectation value of energy by a unitary evolution. That's what's called a passive system. And the system's completely passive if arbitrary um, large copies of the system is also passive. Connected computer, it just says low battery, so. Oh, it should be. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. That, I'm going to do my best. Oh. Mm -hmm. You need a. Uh, There's one of those people behind. Yeah, it's about here. Going to here. Where is it? Um, this is. Sorry. No, that, that's a USB. I had the one that I borrowed last time. And, oh, it it's, it's, it's here. It's still plugged in. It's still plugged in. That's I brought, it. It's still there. OK, good. OK, good. Thank you. OK, so let's just, for the moment, Let's say, okay, we're going, we're, we're going to accept for the case of arguments that if you've got to keep that, that's an appropriate probability distribution to associate with. Deferring the question of what probability means in the classical context. And also, if you've got a system that's in thermal equilibrium with a heat that detection T, that's the appropriate distribution for that kind of canonical distribution. So, um, it's very often convenient to write this parameter in inverse temperature. Um, Okay, um, right. okay. everyone got that? This is probably not new to most of you. Okay, and then we define the um, Gibbs entropy as your son, by my entropy. Um, I don't, okay, that's supposed to be log rho and not f. When it has it's a copy and pasting between quantities and that. So yeah, it could be a trace of, it could be a trace of. Right. There we go. Um, sometimes in books you'll see the k emitted. You can always q2 units in k equals one. But, all right, okay. And just out of um, the dual. I mean, that's kind of important about the k. You think the k 
He's introduced initially really to thermodynamics, and his value has something to do with thermodynamic behavior. Yeah. And you've got a K of one point, and you're exactly saying it's not clear that that is. Oh, well, it's not clear yet, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So I'm giving the, maybe I'm doing this in a remarkable order. I'll show you how, when you try to do thermodynamics, how these things just pop up. OK. Great. Right. They, it, it, it's, it's not like I'm pulling them out of the air. Yeah. They pop up in front of the analysis. OK. All right, so important facts about the, you know, about the um, entropy, and this is true both for the Gibbs and von Neumann, that's why I just write S. It's conserved under Hamiltonian evolution. And that's true even if the Hamiltonian is time dependent. So you might be manipulating these parameters. Um, you're, you're not. Um, yeah. It's still Hamiltonian evolution. Um, for any um, t, and now t, t you can just think of as a number, um, you say, okay, let's consider I've got a Hamiltonian, I've got t, I've got, I've, I've, I've got this, the, this s, I want to find a distribution that makes that as low as possible. The answer in both the Campasco and the quantum case is it's a canonical way. Um, uh, it's the, um, the, the canonical distribution. And this may look familiar to some of you because energy minus Ts is the um, free energy. So canonical distribution, thermal state minimizes the free energy. Or in this case, it's about expectation values. So, okay, so it, it's, it's, it's conceptually different even though you think these will be cool back there. And so that it, 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 if I have a joint system, and this is true for both the Gibbs and the Neumann entropy, the um, entropy of the joint system is less than or equal to the sum of the entropies of the um, subsystems, where these are, are the reduced density matrix or the marginal distribution. And equality only when it's a product distribution. Yes? Is there anything quick we can say about non Hamiltonian? Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so um, in general, yeah, yeah, um, you might have, say, some kind of completely positive operation. Those that are increase or decrease the energy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so suppose you've got a system that you want to think of it as, as your, your heat engine. And you've got a bunch of heat pads um, uh, at, at, um, at, at temperatures Ti. And at T0, your system it was, it is not interacting with these, with, these, um, with, with, with these heat pads, so there's no interaction term. Hamiltonian, and you've got joint distribution over the whole thing such that A is uncorrelated with things that's. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to let the thing interact. So you might turn on an interaction. It might be, you know, to be like you bring them into contact with the heat pads or something like that. Um, you know, it's interacting with only one of them at a time, possibly exchanging energy with them. And um, so the QI would be the energy uh, obtained from B, bi positive if, if, if it's if, if it being if the energy of the system is increasing negative if, it, if it's, if it's um, decreasing and um, suppose we operate this in a cycle in the sense that we bring back the marginal of at t one the marginal of a is the same as to n t zero so in between there you know, because there's interactions. At T0, it's uncorrelated. It might not be uncorrelated at T1, but we, we restore the marginal. And that's what we mean in this context. Sorry, the marginal is the, the reduced matrix. What, what's the marginal? The, 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 mar the marginal is the restriction of the probability distribution to the degree of freedom of the thing. So in the quantum case, it's the reduced density operator. In the classical case, you just integrate out the degrees of freedom of, 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 the, of the rest of the system. But it's not hard. Um, 
It's only like a few, a few, a few, a few lines, and I'm just going to leave it as an exercise. But from those facts that we, uh, that I showed you on the previous page, that if you take the expectation values of, of the heat exchanges, it satisfies this. With equality, it, only if the product process is re reversible. And I mean the process is reversible is there's another process that, 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 that can go in the opposite direction with the expectation values of those QIs reversed. So, and so I promised you I was going to get a theorem with the QIs of the expectation values. There it is. And um, really, it's like three lines. Um, okay. But that means that, you know, that was arbitrarily you know, the number of heat beds. Um, if um, I have just two and count the work as the difference between the heat I, heat I get from one and the plus of the other, then um, the expectation value of the work obtained will be. So that's, you know, so that's basically saying, OK, you know, Maxwell's, you, you, you might, on, if you're, if you're, um, you might occasionally get more than the Carnot um, energy, or the Carnot of work, limit on work. You might, but you also might get less. In the long run, you, you know, you're not going to beat the citizen, be, be the limit. Questions about, questions about that? All right. All right. So again, under the same situation, but we're no longer restricting it to a a, um, a cyclic process. Then, um, if you look at so you've got T zero and um, and T one, and you look at them at, at T zero, the, the system is uncorrelated with the baths. At T one, it might not be. You'll get the difference of the entropy of the marginal. You'll you'll get that. And here's the important thing that um, you have to have equality there if it's a reversible process. So if you're looking for some kind of functional, you know, a functional of the probability distribution in the classical case, or a probability function for the uh, functional of the reduced that's the operator, and you want to say, okay, I have equality there for a reversal process, that uniquely tells you that functional has to be that. So that's what we're going to say. These don't come out of nowhere. They have a use, and the use is for basically getting an analog of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, um, here, in general, this is going to be correlated. So you know, like if interesting things happen, this is not, even if this is a true state, this is not going to be a true state. So um, uh, you know, interacting with the, with the heat baths is going to, in general, you know, um, increase the you know, can in, can increase the um, the 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 Now, um, and the 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 which of course is, doesn't introduce any asymmetry. And you might say, okay, yeah. Yeah, this is a symmetric under a change of, of P1 to P0. But the reason it's not symmetric under a change of P1 and P0 is we made different assumptions about the states of things at P1 and P0. We assumed that. A is uncorrelated with the heat pass of T0 and not at T1. So 
T1 and T0 enter asymmetrically into the statement of the theorem, and so the theorem is, is not symmetric under the interchange of T0 and T1. The theorem itself doesn't care which is earlier and which is later. This is true whether or not T1 is earlier or later, but when we, when we apply it, in practice, we'll think, OK, I've got all these heat paths that equilibrated. I've got the system. Before it's gonna, I interact with it, it's going to be uncorrelated. And I think there's a temptation to sort of say that, OK, and yeah, that's just, OK, there's no, if, you, if there's no common cause, there's no, there, there, there's no interaction. I mean, I, I wrap the correlation as the default. But of course, you know, there are common events in the past of these things. I think what really counts is that the process of equilibration effectively effaces any correlations that they might have. So even if there's correlations buried deep in the, with the, 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 with the, 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 the uh, even if there's some you know, deeply buried correlation between this system and this system, you know, thing, it's not going to matter for, for, um, for um, macroscopic um, uh, um, concerns, and so we can get away with using that product state. Any okay, questions about that? All right. Okay. So, that's, so this is important, that, that, that if you're looking for something that is going to play the role of entropy analogous to the way entropy get analogous to the, 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 the way you get introduced in thermodynamics, except I'm going to take expectation values rather than the actual values. Um, these are the guys. Uh, also, I think mean, one, one thing that um, is important is this is perfectly general under the conditions of perfect. In particular, this doesn't depend on the distribution of the energy change being sharply peaked around those expectation values. There could be wild fluctuations. You know, you might be trying to run a, a heat engine with a Brownian particle, um, and you get wildly different results on every run. The expectation values is the size of this. Let's about that. OK. OK. Um, another. Um, Little, little result I want to put is, okay, as before, we're going to have the Hamilton system depend on certain parameters which I can use to perform work. Um, suppose if, if, if I want to model a reversible process, what the textbooks talk, call it, say is, well, that's one where it's effectively in, in, in equilibrium at all times. And so, you know, I might. It pulled this out a little bit, reducing the pressure, and then it equilibrates and do it again and again and again. So we're looking for, we're going to look at a very small change. So sometime t, the system's in equilibrium with heat bath at temperature t. And as I said earlier, we're going to use a kind of distribution to represent its state of that. We make a small changes to the parameters, possibly doing a small bit of work. And then put the system of in, in heat bath with a heat bath that it could be at a different temperature, could be at, a, at the same temperature, doesn't affect well, if it's a different temperature, it's only slightly different. And you can compare the expectation value of the of the energy for those two canonical distributions. And that's what the difference is. And the difference between the expectation values of um, uh, of those um, Cannot keep up energy in those canonical distributions are this is expectation value of work done, and that's the rest. And that's actually where it is, it's using this formula that, um, that gives initially introduces this, gives give, give that entropy. So it doesn't, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Um, so if I want to. Um, Track changes in, in and condition changes of energy in, in, in a process that proceeds in small steps. Um, that'll help me track the um, 
Um, that, 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 that will help me track the um, amount of the, 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 the partition between uh, work and work and and um, um, and um, heat. And notice, like, but now the current situation is. Okay, maybe the whole system heat that plus my system is undergoing unitary evolution, but I'm putting in contact with the heat that, putting in contact with another heat that, the um, system itself is, you know, is not going to be evolving unitarily. So, so let me just reduce this to a bumper sticker yeah. uh, and see if it's the right Okay. As, as somebody who said yesterday, well, you've got these rows in the game yeah, they right. come from. So what you've been showing us, if I'm tracking correctly, right. Is they're coming in the context of Carnot engines, for example, right. from using a canonical distribution for the heat vests. Yes. And so, as long as you're happy with that, okay, there you've really got, you know, and, and, and you can think of that statistically as this is just statistical averages over time or whatever. Yes. And all you have characterizing the heat map is the temperature. Right. So I'm going to put that in and then run these calculations for the averages. Yes. And understanding where the canonical distribution comes from in the heat map, right. again, it's another kind of application of thermodynamics right. that you, you have to go through to, to, to sort of, if you see what I mean, there's, right. a, there's a kind of backstory there, there, yes, there is a backstory there which um, I've deferred. Right? Yeah, that's fine. I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm right. not asking you to give right. it. I'm just yeah. tracking where it came yeah, from. Yeah, that's right. absolutely right. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah so um, the thing is, um, if this is the purpose that you're using these guys for, it's just fine. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, they're introduced for a purpose. They're good for that purpose, and they're not good for other purposes you might think an engine. Um, okay, now, I want to get some water. It's getting very warm. Yeah. Well, we didn't turn up the, I mean, yeah. the controls but, for the... I would appreciate it if some of you could I think the controls are back there. They used to be on top of the... Is, is the tap water drinkable? Yes. Okay. Yes. The so tap water comes more or less from the same place as the bottle water. So okay. It's beautiful, clean, beautiful. Yeah. All right. Because we're taking a little break. Yeah. Okay, I mean, that's all. Yeah.
the microcanonical distribution, which is confined to an energy surface. Right? So basically, if you take a uniform distribution between two energy surfaces and take the limit, that's a microcanonical distribution. And he considered, well, what would be an appropriate analog of entropy for that? And he gives um, two candidates. And all of these things in the limit of large n are approximately equal to each other. And it says, okay, all of these things are candidates for statistical mechanical analogs of thermodynamic entropy. So it's interesting to leading to say this is the Gibbs entropy, but it turns out in practice to have been the one that gets used um, the, the, the most. Okay, okay so two things left to do. Relation between Boltzmann and Gibbs entropies and the relation between Boltzmann and thermodynamic entropies. Okay, so relation between Boltzmann and Gibbs entropy. Suppose I've got some partition of my whole um, state space into macro states. Maybe some of them are bigger than others. Right. M1, M2, etc. And I take a probability distribution that entirely has support entirely within one mac mac macro state and it's uniform in state space variables over that. Then the density uh, that that um, yeah the density for that function for that probability distribution is just going to be con constant within this and zero outside of it, and it has to integrate to one over the volume, so this going to be one over the volume of that. I got that. And if I calculate the um, so the, the von Neumann entropy of that is just um, k times the logarithm of the volume, can do that. If I calculate the Gibbs entropy, for that probability distribution, it's the same. So there is a relation be between uh, um, uh, uh, those things. Um, all right. Now, last question is, what's the relationship between um, the, this and this? Qualitatively, it's very plausible that um, as um, so if you have two states, one of thermodynamic states of one of higher entropy or not, then the higher entropy one will have a larger phase space volume. But the question is, well, if I sit down, if I sit down and do the calculation, if I take two of these macro states and imagine some kind of reversible process that takes me from, from one to another, will the difference in, in the thermodynamic entropies um, as calculated by the integral dq over t between those two macro states along that reversal process, will it actually be k times the log of the ratio of the phase space volumes? And um, here's an argument to the um, effect that the answer is indeed yes, as long as you're dealing with a system with a very large number of degrees of freedom. Um, so I, I, um, basically, this is a kind of law of large numbers things. If you've got some system with a lot of, uh, of, um, of um, there's a system composed of a large number of subsystems, um, and look at the total energy of the system. Well, it would be the sum of all the kinetic energies of the subsystems plus the, the, the potential energy interaction terms between them. And um, suppose that the interactions aren't really so strong that they swap the energy. So most of the energy is a kinetic energy term. So most of the energy is just sum of energy terms. And suppose that, of course, you know, they're interacting with each other. It doesn't have to be a gas. It could be a crystal or something like that. So if it's a crystal, there's correlations between the states of near nearby things. But as long as the correlations between the states of, of one thing are negligible except for a few others, 
like so you, 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 uh, that then um, you can basically apply the weak law of large numbers and argue that the variance of the total uh, total total energy is going to be uh, uh, yeah, or relative to the, 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 the total energy. So I mean, the left hand side needs to be a dimensionless number for this to make this sense. The variance is going to go um, as as a one one over n. So um, well, that's what I mean when I say for these distributions. The, the, the canonical distribution the, um, for a large number of n, the um, energy spread in, the energy distribution energy will start to repeat around it. It's actually based on Okay. Um, and for such a system, we can use these expectation values of things as surrogates for their actual values. Um, not, and this is the same, you know, but that, that's basically this is the sort of thing where um, if you're running a casino and you have, you know, Thousands and thousands of customers, you know, um, placing lots and lots of bets. You can you, you can calculate with a high degree of certainty what your you know, what your profits are going to be and set the odds accordingly. Okay. Um, okay. Now consider two macro states, and I'm assuming the temperature is among the macro variables I'm using to define the macro space. So two macro states with M0 and M1 temperatures T0 and T1. And I'm going to consider the two corresponding canonical distributions. Um, and um, you say, OK, well, I, that's not going to be divine, confined to the macro state. Uh, or sorry, if, if the macro states are on an energy surface, it's not going to be confined to the energy surface, but it's going to be sharply peaked around it, so it's not going to matter too much. So what I mean is canonical distributions um, confined to whatever, you know, if there's, if, there's a, if there's walls around the system, it's within this volume and zero, zero otherwise. Yes, sir. Um, so um, now imagine that in reversible process linking the two macro states, High probability heat exchanges will be close to their expectation values, and therefore the high probability change in Gibbs entropy will, will approximate the change in thermodynamic entropy. And um, if I now want to um, talk about Boltzmann entropy, um, Again, I'm going to assume that um, temperature is one of the macro variables. Um, large system of the con canonical distribution is sharp, sharply peaked around the mean value energy. And then the difference in both, there, the, there's, there's not really a big, the, the difference in both one entropies and the difference in, 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 the, in the Gibbs entropies are going to be. They're, they're going to go like, like 1 over n, something like that. Or 1 over square root of n. I don't remember. <laughs> but, but right. Um, and. For canonical. What's that? But just for canonical. For the canonical, yeah. But yeah, right, yeah. For the, for the canonical. But what I'm saying is that if I've got, let's say, um, an energy surface, like that, you know, suppose this is an energy surface. And I look at a macro state up on the energy surface, then um, or two, you know, two different macro states on the energy surface, and then consider canonical distributions peaked on that energy surface. They're going to be sharply, so sharply peaked that I can use the difference in entropy of those two canonical distributions to approximate the difference in volume of those regions. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Right. So. From, so I had a previous argument that the difference in Gibbs entropy is going to be a sharp, with high probability approximate the, the difference in thermodynamic entropy. And now I'm saying the difference in Boltzmann entropy is, all, is going to approximate the difference in Gibbs entropy, hence thermodynamic entropy. Right, so this is a argument that under those circumstances, differences in Boltzmann entropy between macro states will 
will, will approximate that sort of detour via a Gibbs entropy. And um, a couple months ago, I sent an email to a bunch of people, including Shelley and, and, and Kim and um, you know what, it's okay. If I want to have an argument that under appropriate circumstances, differences in Boltzmann entropy approximate that, here's one way to do it. But for you guys, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know Shelley, you mentioned Gibbs, you must get me behind me saying, <laughs> right? Um, okay, you know, is that our, right. what's that? That's right. Yeah, um, and so um, I said, well, is that argument too Gibbs for you? Oh, and if it, if it is, what argument we use to disprove the place? It? And this, so he said, no, that's fine. So, and, and I want to point this out because Shelley, for those of you who are here last time, last year, Shelley gave a talk um, entitled like, Individualistic and Ensemble Interpretative System Mechanics. And he had a list of bad words, right? And Gibbs entropy was one of them. And then he said, he, then he said in passing, well, one use of um, the um, Gibbsian concept is making connection with thermodynamics. And then he didn't explain. Um, so this what I, everything I've done could be thought of as a footnote to Shelley's talk. Right? So this is so there is a use. If you want to make a connection between this and this, one way to do it is it, it is via a detour uh, through through this under circumstances when those closely approximate each other. Mm -hmm. And if there is a way to do it without the detour, there probably is. But this strikes me as the easiest um, way to do it and even Shelley doesn't disapprove of things like that. So take home message. I want you know, I think that um, everyone should be you know, should be become familiar with, um, with 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 what I've done. And for those students who haven't seen this before, those th th two things I called two easy theorems. They do follow from the, the uh, in, in three or four lines from the facts about canonical distributions and. Um, the, the entropies I said, T you know, take a few minutes sometimes to down and, 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 and improve them. So these things don't come from nowhere. If you're looking for a quantity that is going to fulfill a certain purpose, those are the ones. And just don't try to use them for, for things that they're not good for, which is just you know, a, general, a, a general rule for various co concepts. <laughs> One last thing in that. So, um, black hole um, and entropy got mentioned. Um, can I use this kind of argument to ar to argue to say anything about black hole entropies? I can't. <laughs> but as someone who's not really an expert on these things. Here's what I want the experts to give me. First, so first of all, I want to know that you know, does it make sense to put the thing in contact from in equilibrium with a heat bath? Because if I can do that, then then I know then I, then I think I'm, I'm allowed to use the canonical distribution. Does it, do I have a way of partitioning? Energy exchanges with the with with, 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 with the black hole into work in, into into work and heat. If I have that, then those two things I feel comfortable with using a von Neumann um, entropy for black black holes. If I can, if it's defined. Okay. Um, so that, that's all I want to say. Yeah. I mean, there's one feature of the Gibbs entropy that you mentioned in passing, but some people put a lot of emphasis on that, that these canonical ensembles are those that maximize the Gibbs entropy or minimize the free energy, as you said, and some are just almost at the center of statistical mechanics, the sort of maximal entropy principle or something like that. Right. Do you see value in that? Yeah, so E.T. James, what he did is so um, Gibbs argues for um, 
use of the entropy in the way I just said. And, he, and, and um, it is true that um, the canonical ensemble, the canonical distribution maximizes this entropy. Uh, I'm sorry. So, so um, if, you, if, I, if I fix expectation value of the energy and say what distribute, get, you know, Give it subject, to cons subject to the constraint that the, the distribution has this expectation value of energy, what distribution maximizes the, the entropy? And what J James done, did was he said, Gibbs didn't realize it, but he, he discovered a general principle of reasoning that if you have certain constraints, you should set your credences to be the one that maximizes entropy uh, subject to those constraints. Where does this general principle come from? He pulls it out of the air. What rationale is there from it, for it? No. E.T. James says that this thou shalt set thy grievances this way. Um, and it's, um, it's this legacy of this old bad idea that there's a principle of indifference that uniquely so a principle of indifference is supposed to uniquely set your credences in the absence of any information at all. James says, well, if you have a little bit of information, so you have some kind of constraint on your probability distribution, like you know what the expectation supposed by value is supposed to be, then here's my generalization of the principle of indifference. Um, yeah, um, it's garbage. <laughs> Just like your principle of indifference is. Yeah. What do you mean by start? You'll be led straight if you use that? You won't, like, like what sense is the garbage? Um, so, um, a principle of indifference is supposed to set unique credences in the absence of any knowledge whatsoever. That makes no sense. Yeah. Well, can, can yeah. I actually just yeah. maybe make this a little more vivid? Yeah. I am a six-sided guy in my car. Yes. About which you know nothing except it's got six sides. Now, if you're willing to bet with me on odds of one sixth for each outcome, you think those are fair bets? I'm really happy to be in. Now, if you happen to know this die is uniform and exactly cubical and the little edges haven't been worn down and there have been no little weights that have been put in it. Then it's a different situation, but that's very specific knowledge. Right. That's not ignorance. That's very specific, right. highly constraining knowledge right. of the symmetries, physical symmetries of the system. Right. But if you honestly think that in your state of complete ignorance of that guy, it's rational for you to think it's one out of six, I'm very happy. Right. Yeah. Well, why? I mean, why? I mean, why? 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 So but, that's it. Keep going. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make bets with him, and in the long run, he's gonna lose money. Hang on, hang on. So what do you mean in the long run? When, how, how long do you think? Bet? How long do you think I'm gonna hold on to the assumption that it's one in six? I'm gonna. Hide I don't that. know. You're the one. Who, I don't know. No, 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 no. The it's, from the game. It applies for the first one, and then I'm gonna start but, okay. but why should it apply to the first one? one? Why don't I assume from the oh, okay, so I mean, if, if you're gonna okay, okay, so a merger. Right. If you're going to use a merger, where you begin doesn't matter. That's the point of merger. Okay, but I can't, I can't use Bayes' theorem and update credences if I don't start somewhere. Yeah, you're going to use Bayes' theorem. But no, <laughs> but still, let me use Bayes' theorem. So if you start, if, so if you start with um, some kind of priority but with the bias of that type. So, all right, so the principle of indifference says you know nothing about it, therefore you should be you should have your credences concentrated on that being a fair die. That updating is is not going to change much of those. No, no, no. Who, who but, said but, anything about credences on a fair die? They right. said it's one and six. Right, yeah. So it, so here, here's the thing. Um, it, uh, um, if you start out with your degrees of belief equally divided between those, be, 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 between those six faces and update them as, as, as you go, you, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. You, 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 in the long run, you, won't, you, won't, you probably won't, won't lose. So here's the thing. There's a, there's a difference between um, 
that, that I think when people talk about the Baker Curse of Learners, they get blurred between a judgment of symmetry, a judgment that each each face is equally equally like as each chance, and an absence of judgment whatsoever. So both of those situations are situations in which your 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 credences are symmetrical under um, interchange of, of 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 the faces, but there's a big difference between. Thinking it's a, it'd be pretty sure it's a, it'd be a big sure it's a fair die, and mm -hmm. having no clue as as to what the bias is. Wait, 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 on any of those three hours. So you know, I'll take the bet. I'll take the bet. I'll take the bet. I absolutely guarantee you I will take the bet. And okay. do it just once. You're welcome. So hang on. Let's no, no, no. Okay. Don't, don't, six, don't, six, don't, don't, don't. Six, 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 Will you give me a million to one on? If I say, if I know what I'm correct, one out of three possible expectation value is, is there three zero. Is, there are three possible outcomes. Are you willing to bet at, at one third odds on, on any of the three outcomes in this? I'll pay a dollar to win. What? I'll pay a dollar to win three bet. Okay. <laughs> Shall we do that? Sure. Okay, good. I'll take that bet with you right now. The device I have is a coin. The three outcomes are it lands heads, it lands sails, it ends up on its side. I'm about to flip it. It's I'm not going to touch it. It's going to land on the floor. If it lands on its side, I pay you. If it does not, you pay me. Ready? Pay <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it doesn't stop the other thing. Look, it's still on the side. Pay me. Still on the side. So pay me. That's it. I, what, do you want it, it, the important thing was me just to tell you they're A, B, and C? No, no, but I get to choose one. The, the randomness comes in that you label them and then I have nothing in the labels and then I pick one of the labels. But then you think you must... If I get unlucky and choose the side, then I lose, sure. But if, if you, you would, well, you're saying it's rational to regard those as equally valid. No, 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 that's what he means. But then so he's taking into account also, the fact that you're also met and very eager to engage. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So, okay, so he, he has. So that's why he wants if, to choose which. Bring it all you like. All I'm saying, you like, 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 whatever you behind the scenes, what you present me with is I label whatever outcomes you devise as A, B, and C. I get to choose. To roll it, and then I'll choose A, B, and C. And all I'm saying is, it's rational for me to take. But if you, if you. It's rational for me to take those bets, especially let's just just by, so it's it's I'll pay a dollar and I get a million dollars back. It's it's if you just wrap if you label them A, B, and C, and then I choose one of those random, uh, I I that the expectation value for that. I I I'm really not understanding what you're saying. I mean, Dave, what David says about this strikes me is exactly on target. The rational attitude should be I haven't got a goddamn clue what my credences should be. No, okay. And on that basis, you cannot apply Bayes' theorem and you cannot calculate expected probabilities and you cannot apply the normal rules. I just wrote a letter on one of the pages in my, okay? Um, and I'll, 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 here's the game. Um, you paid me a dollar to correct the guess in the letter, it's one of the English letters, you know, my, uh, 26 options, mm -hmm. I'll give you a million dollars. Okay, should you pay that game? Now, if you want to do the usual expectation value thing, you need to know you do a, a probability times expected value of, I mean, and all that comes out. If you say, I have no clue, then you don't take that bet. If you say, well, it's not like I know the probabilities, but um, I'm in some sort of, you know, I, I'm in a 1 in 26 I, no, situation. No, you're, you're calculating the wrong probability. And I have no clue of any probability for any particular letter on that. Okay. 
I do know that if I randomly choose a letter, and I didn't care that you wrote it down, if I randomly choose a letter, then I have a 1 out of 26 chance of choosing the right one. But that is not any kind of credence about what's on that page. Surely that's what it, well. No, it is not. Surely it's not an argument. It is not. I know nothing about what's on that page. What I know is that whatever's on that page, I know that whatever's on that page, if I randomly choose the letters with a flat distribution, I have a 1 out of 26 chance of getting the right one. I just, I just go principle, principle, and then. Well, you can. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Principle, okay. Principle. What, what the, what the credence is saying is precisely that, uh, you know, it, you, you don't overinterpret it. But it's precisely saying no twenty-six. All it, all it means is twenty-two possibilities, and I don't know which one it is. I, I can say I know I, I have a reasonable one out of twenty-six credence that I will win this bet. But it is not derived from any distribution at all, credence distribution over what's on it. Okay. It's amazing until now, David, it's not touch on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, so I've had my hand up. Yeah, um, well. And so is Travis. <laughs> so, right, I, I think. Um, um, I, I think a lot was lost in the discussion. Um, a, a lot was lost of what Wayne was saying in the subsequent discussion about it. And, and it, it seems to me that Travis asked exactly the right question, and I, I don't think he got a good answer. So okay. let me just, okay. let, let, this, is not, this is not your doing, this is, this is what happened in the subsequent yeah. Look, um, first of all, let, let me just see if I have the position straight. Right. Tim drew a sharp contrast between um, just knowing that the die has six sides and knowing that the die is uniformly weighted. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, he thought there was all the difference in the world between those two cases. The implication being that once you know the die is uniformly weighted, nothing further has to be added. That is, it is a sort of principle of reason in the Jamesian sense, okay? That, uh, that we should bet, and, and we know how it's going to, wait, wait, wait. Okay. And we know macroscopically how it's going to be flipped and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, hold on one second. I just want to make sure I have this straight, okay? Um, Tim thought that made a big difference, okay? If I understood Wayne correctly, Wayne would dispute that. Okay, let me, let me see back. Am I right about that? Um, I would certainly dispute it. And, and well, my understanding of you was, was that you would too. Yes, yeah, so um, let, me, and, let, me, let me respond okay, to what you just said. And I just want to yeah. say something to Travis. Right, and then Tim, right. right. So, um, right. so suppose I, I know an awful lot about the die and how it's going to be flipped. Right. And that I, is sort of macroscopic. Right, right. Macroscopic, yeah, it's, right. It, exactly. Right. And I judge the situation to be symmetrical with respect to everything I regard as, as relevant to the chance. Right. right, right. Because obviously it's not completely. Symmetrical just in a way that I have no clue is symmetrical. So, no, 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 symmetrical in a different, in, in a different, in a, in a, in a, um, in a, um, yeah, okay, in, 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 now I don't get the difference, but anyway. Okay, okay, yeah, so, maybe this will help. Um, um, so sometimes people attribute some kind of principle of indifference to Laplace. And so let me just quote Laplace on, 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 on this. The background of this is, for a while, people were saying the probability of an event is just the number of ways the event could happen divided right. by the total number of ways of the And in an encyclopedia article, Diderot considered the following game. You, um, flip, you, you win if, you, if you're flipping a coin and you get two tries and you win if you get tails. Right, so there's three ways that the game could happen. I get tails on the um, first flip, and the game's over. 
Or I can get heads on the flip, first flip, tails on the second flip, and I win. Or two heads. Three ways the eggs can happen. Diderot argued in all sincerity that my odds of winning that game are too low. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, everybody else is wrong about this. <laughs> if you seriously believe that you can define probability as the number of ways things can happen divided by the total of food round, then Diderot's art of reasoning is faultless. And in the philosophical essay on probabilities, Laplace does something kind of strange because he presents what he calls two principles of, 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 of the calculus of probability. But actually, they're not two principles. They're, they're a little mini dialogue. Because the first principle says the definition of probability is just what I said, the number of ways that, that can happen divided by the total. And then the next one is, but that presupposes that the cases be equally possible. And if they're not, we'll have to determine which cases are equally possible. And this is one of the most subtle questions in the doctrine of the Cowboy Chances. So, if you have a judgment about to die that each side is equally likely to come up, then you should think that they're equally likely to come up. Right? So, so here's what I would say. If the, the principle of indifference requires as an input a partition of the ways of things, uh, of things be that you already have judged to be equally likely. Was that a yes or a no? Um, I, I don't know if I understand the question. I, the, the, so, so if I, if I have a judgment really about, <laughs> so if I have, so if I have a sense about what's relevant to the points of, of heads, and a judgment situation we have submitted, not just as far as I know, but my judgment says the situation to be actually symmetric with respect to everything relevant to ch ch chances, I should, I, I should regard those as every Of course. As that's my, that, that seems analytically true. If, and that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's true, but it's completely trivial. Right. I don't right. think that, that you can, I, I don't think, and it's, it's completely trivial in the sense, in exactly what I said, so the principle of difference tells you if you have a partition into things that you regard as equally likely, you should regard as equally likely. That is, I think, uncontroversially okay, and utterly empty. That's absolutely. Right. So I agree with everything okay. you just right. said. Right. But but as you self-emphasize in the last sentence of what right. you said, it's not clear whether that amounts to a yes or a no answer to my question. Okay, so say your question. Again. Okay, my question was: Tim made a big deal just now about how different it would be. Right. Um, how different the following two cases would be, yeah. okay? Um, you know that the die has six sides, right. and you know that it has six sides and it's uniformly weighted, sure. and you're going to flip it by a certain macroscopic procedure. Uh, yeah. so I, think, I think those are very different. different. Right, 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 right. right, right. What, say it again? I think those are very different. Oh, I was surprised to hear that. Um, um, and I guess I, I disagree. Okay, let me tell you why I, 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 I think um, they're very different. Um, what happens now, in, so first case, I'm certain that it's, a, that it's a fair die. In the second case, I might entertain various conjectures. Wait, fair die is just a claim about the distribution of weight? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. In the second case, but I might... It's not a claim about the probability prima facie. Yes, it is because, because in the, what I'm including in that judgment is that it's symmetric in every way relevant to the to to the chance. But that's different. But, but I don't understand. That Those is, are certainly not logically related to one. Yes, I, yes, yeah. Okay, when I say fair die, um, doesn't it doesn't only mean that there's symmetric a a a, 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 a um, symmetric mass distribution. It's it, cubical. Right. It's going to be flipped by a certain right. macro procedure. It right. Puts all those things. Right. Right. And you know, it doesn't have a magnetic moment that yeah, rises yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And then if I if I you know if I if I proceed to list all the things that it doesn't have, what I'm saying is it's symmetrical to everything I regard relevant to the chance of, of, of I don't of understand why you say that. Because it's not symmetrical in every distribution. No, 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 no. In no. every respect. No, because we couldn't be able to The word probability hasn't come up yet in anything you said. 
What's it? Okay. It's, 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 right. It, uh, um, the what? So why am I picking out cert, so uh, I'm satisfied it's a fair die if it's symmetrical with respect to blah 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 blah. Right. Um, Wait. If it's symmetrical, as you rightly said. In all respects which are relevant to the probability. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay, right. good. Okay. Good. Good. Cool. But that's exactly the same as saying I think each head has equal so probability. Good. 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 No, no, no. I don't understand. We agreed before that a certain statement was analytic. Okay. 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 Right, yeah, so that, Nobody, as you rightly say, there's no dispute about that. Okay, so the, okay, the difference between being certain that the situation is, is symmetric in respect to everything relevant to the, the, the chance of, of, of rain and having no clue is the following. If I have no clue, um, I might think, okay, Tim is, you know, antis was anticipating this kind of discussion coming up and he, 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 he has a loaded die in his pocket. And I might entertain various conjectures about how it's loaded. And if, um, so, let me get to this finish, because this is very important. If I'm entertaining various connection conjectures about how, how it's loaded, um, you know, though my credences about the, uh, about the loadings might be symmetrical under the interchange of, of, of the faces, and I think it's equally likely to go in favor of one and, and two and stuff like that. However, if I have non-zero credence in being loaded in various ways, and Tim starts um, rolling the, the, the thing and telling me the results, I can use an update and updating and update my credence of the, uh, about that. And if I am, um, yeah, if it starts, if it's coming up one again and again and again, that will increase my credence that, let me do this, that will increase my credence that is, that is loaded towards one and change what I'm willing to bet on the next one five. If I'm certain it's a fair die, well, fair, well, let's say it again. Fair yeah. die means equal probable, or yeah. fair die means e e uniform e weight. E can, can, can I just make it? Uh, 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 okay. Okay. okay, let's not use the word probability. Use the word chance and increase. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're having a, a miscommunication. Yeah. Can I just make a small yeah. right. linguistic intervention? Yeah. What I mean by a fair die, and what the normal population of English speakers do by it is that it is geometrically excludes almost everyone. It is geometrically cubical right. and the mass right. the, but when that the is used to be used to by a fair die but when is you, one where David, let me finish. Yeah. And that's just a fact about this, the actual symmetries of the die, and that is positive really important knowledge. It's not ignorance of anything. It's positive, very specific knowledge yes. of the physical characters that are. Now, if you roll dice, you want not only for them to be fair, but you want them to be rolled in a fair mm -hmm. manner. Yeah. Now, rolling in a fair manner is a much harder thing to analyze because you yeah. can't appeal to obvious symmetries right. in the same way. Right. So I, I just want to separate those things, and I propose to always use the term fair die just to mean the first thing, okay, which is a clearly defined okay. physical characteristic which you have to have positive knowledge of the die to believe. It's nothing to do with English, okay. it's just the opposite. Very detailed. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you want to talk about fair rolling, we have a very complicated discussion about fair rolling if you want to get into it. Well, there's some people who can, okay. could cause fair coin. Well, Percy Diaconis has a, a coin-tossing yeah. device yeah. that, that yeah. always tosses, you know, it comes down and weighs the, the yeah, so, so let me just say it. Being, not a fair there is a difference between being certain that it's a fair die and not having a clue about what die what bias it might make. And it shows up in what happens when I when I get information about the, the, the um, about about the uh, the thing. So if I'm certain it's a fair die and he tosses it ten times and comes up one each time, if I'm really certain it's a fair die, I. I, I will say that must have been a fluke, and it won't change what, what, what I'm going to bet next. However, if I had the slightest inkling that it might be, but Tim might have a a, um, a die bias towards one, that will in, that, that will increase my credence that it's biased towards one. It'll be more likely to buy it, bet on one on that one. There's a difference between those two things. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. 
this conversation started because you were you were talking about principle indifference. You said principle indifference is bullshit because of yeah. this experiment data. So first of all, I just want to say like let's let's remove you from the equation because a, a large part of your intuition here is the fact that it's another person that's doing it, and people always have their own motivations for things, and you should always be skeptical that they're trying to swim you. So let's suppose we come across just a random um, uh, coin on the side of the road or a, a dice on the side of the road and there's a, a neutral party with me and we want to bet on what's going to happen when we roll that dice. The second thing I'm going to say is the credence that I have that the dice is fair is not the same thing as the credence um, I have about whether the outcome will be a one, right? That we were kind of getting into that there. Yeah. I should absolutely use the principle of indifference when betting on whether the outcome will be one. Why? The principle of difference tells me nothing about whether it's a fair die. It only tells me about whether I should bet on it being one. Okay, let's let us let us well, you just made an assertion. I don't understand. No, let me let me respond. Okay. okay. So I think in the example that it changed from a coin to a die. But, so we, we 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 come across a coin line there, right? Yes. Um, and you, you say, okay, I know nothing about this the, 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 this coin. I'm going to bet on even odds uh, on, on one flip of it. Right. That's fine. Um, you tell me the principle of indifference tells you that. Yes. And I say, well, why that didn't the principle of indifference tell you that um, you should ascribe equal probability to the three possibilities that they can talk about? Heads up, tails up, and then Because I have initial knowledge that I do know that, I do know that um, from my extensive experience of coins, that it's really unlikely that something on that side. I do yeah. have additional knowledge. Good. So I'm only, I am only indifferent between the tail no, no. heads at this point. Right. That's the only thing I'm going to read. Okay, so I have claimed that you're, you, the, that, um, the you, you don't know from your extensive experience with coins, all you know is that it won't land on its side. Right. You don't know anything about right. the relative right. frequencies of heads and tails. Right. Well, well no. For all your extensive experience with coins, is that. <laughs> I don't understand. That's, that, that's, that's not a true statement okay. about what your extensive experience is. Let me just get to that. I, yeah, I, I, just I agree with Tim. This whole discussion is incredibly confused. I, yeah, I, 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 just, I just want why. to <laughs> again, just give the real passing response to that. Right. Um, so, some people think a principle indifference is supposed to set your credences in a state of absolute difference. <laughs> I don't think there is such a principle. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to finish. Okay, yeah, that's right. not, not what Janice is saying. Sure. Um, right. right. Well, as a special case, is, is the no constraint. Right. No, 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 no. Wayne, help us here. Because okay, I'm going to get it. Hold on one second. Let me just finish my sentence and then, and then, yeah. then I'll say, okay. Um, so, um, Principle indifference is supposed to tell, set your 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 credences in a state of absolute ignorance. I don't think there is such a thing, sure. Be, right? Because um, you, to get started, you have to um, take as input a part the right partition. You, you'll get different credences that we, we, we depend on different partitions of the state of the world. Right. So to get started, you need a partition that you regard as in you know Laplace's judgment equally possible possible equal problem. So there's a trivial analytic thing that says if you judge every element of this condition equally probably you should set equal the degree right. of it. That's un analytic utterly trivial. Right. Okay. But it's not the principle of indifference. It, it, you know, the principle so, of indifference is supposed to be substantive. Here, here's what I was confused yeah. about. Yeah. And maybe somebody can just clear this right. up for me. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Mm -hmm. Okay. You you seem to present James right. as making essentially the same error as the principle of indifference people. I am saying that. Yes. Good. Um, um, that is, it doesn't matter how much you add, how much substantive stuff you add, as long as it's not explicitly probabilistic about symmetries of the situation, about equal weighting of the die, okay, about, you know, about variations, microscopic variations in a macroscopic flipping procedure, so on and so forth. That's all James' strategy. He says, no, no, I don't believe in a principle of indifference. But if you add these other symmetries, 
then you can draw an a priori conclusion from those about probabilities. Now, what confused me is I thought you were objecting to that, but I didn't see the difference between that and what Tim was saying. Um, so, yeah, I would say that it's a mistake to think that you're going to get an a, a priori judgment about probabilities. Okay. Um, because you, you tell me, you tell me about all parts of speakers of the of symmetry. Of all sorts of symmetries, equal, uniform right. weighting, right. symmetries right. in the way I flip right. it. And, right, and then, and then there, were all, there will also be asymmetries in the situation. Because there may not, but I, be, what do you mean? If we're flipping a die, it has different numbers on the faces. The, the different yeah. outcomes have to be distinguishable. That's, of course, true. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm getting the relevance. Right, right. So there are symmetries. So you tell me a list of symmetries and asymmetries. And, uh, so you tell me, if you tell me everything about the physical situation, yeah. it'll be a list of symmetries and asymmetries. Sounds good. Right. I need to know, make a judgment about whether those asymmetries are relevant to the probability ah, good. Of, of, good. Of, uh, of, the, of the outcome. Good. Of Good. So, but given, now we're getting back to the analytics. So, so, give, so, given a list of symmetries and asymmetries in the situation, yeah, and a substantive judgment about whether those asymmetries are relevant okay. to the to so the let me sum outcome, it up like this. Then, then you get a judgment of the problem. Good, 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 good. Right. It's good. So, here's what we want, and here's what we need to do. Right. We have symmetries of a certain situation. Right. Okay. And like you say, we have symmetries and we have asymmetries. Okay? We want to we want to infer probabilities from this situation, okay? From what we know of this situation, okay? Good. There are two ways to do it, okay? Just as a logical matter, okay? You do it without any further empirical input, okay? That's what I mean by a priori. Okay. okay, you get from these the statement of these symmetries and asymmetries right. to probability judgments. Mm -hmm. You do it either a priori, or you don't do it a priori. You do it empirically. Right. Okay, you say when these symmetries obtain, our empirical experience is that the relative frequencies mm -hmm. are such and such. Right. That's a very stark difference. Right. Okay. My impression was, in what you said, that you were coming down firmly on the side of the empirical, of the further empirical input. Yes. Good. And but that's what Tim is denying. Okay, is it? No. Yeah. No. I didn't think it was. I, I, I think the way David set this up right now is entirely not at all what I had in mind. And he's drawing a false dichotomy and trying to push me into a position. And it's so, 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 so let me say, so, 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 so there's some other things to say. Look, Travis gave you an example. You're walking along, you see a coin sitting there. You already have a, One issue is, is there any rational principle that connects ignorance with creeds? Which would stop. Yeah. <laughs> right? That would be strange. Right. No, no. You see, first of all, you know, like, so I was like, looks like a horse, right? The horse more or less flat and more or less, can I finish? More, more, can I finish? Yes. More or less, you know, cylindrical. Uh, you know what? Suppose you come across a box that has a button that says push me and has a green and a red light on it, and you've never seen one before, and you have no idea what's in the box. Okay, and if you tell me, oh, you 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 should have a you know a, a rational credence of one half that if you push the button, the right red light will come on, and and I'll say you're nuts. On on what basis would that be a rational credence? You have no idea what the hell is in that box, and you shouldn't have any credences at all. Now, David keeps talking about a priori. I agree. Nothing can be done a priori if you need independently of all experience. Okay. But there are all kinds of middle grounds between what you described and that. For example, you said, oh, the experience must be experience of devices like that in your past. They did this. No, you didn't. Yes, you did. No, I gave that as an example of what's an experience. Okay. okay. But if, if, if you count, of course, all the input that I think you take into account 
is physical information that you've got empirically. You've got empirically that the thing is a fair die in the sense that I said you have empirically facts that you think the laws of physics are going to vary. Nobody's denying that there's empirical input in what you said. The question is, does the empirical input go all the way to entailing logically the probability? If not, we want to know how you bridge that gap. Okay, is that gap bridged with further empirical input, or is it bridged with some kind of principle of reason? I would say, if yeah. I know enough about the die, and yeah. I know enough about the throwing mechanism, yeah. that I might be able to prove a typicality result yeah. that says, typically, okay. long-term okay. frequencies, right. if you do this, will be a sixth, or right. not a sixth. Right, uh, that, that's, that's, so, Okay. Now we're back at a place where we've been in any Okay, time. but that's where it is. Don't okay. mischaracterize. I don't think I there's don't anything think I can worry about. Okay. I, I don't think that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Explain. Explain, sir. Tim, there might be a disagreement. So if I tell you of some statement that the credence I have is a third, mm -hmm. what did I just tell you? In, in your I, I have absolutely no idea. I don't have credences that have numerical value, so I actually don't know what. <laughs> I really have. I'm, I'm being honest. I have no idea. People think they have credences that are real numbers. I don't have credences that are real numbers. I really don't. Okay, then your disagreement with James is a long way back. Well, <laughs> long it says so the, whole the whole Bayesian setup of this is a weird idealization that's way away from reality. So you just should be aware of that. Which it obviously is. Do so you think you'll feel about your credences? The, the claim of, uh, so, so, do you think you'll feel about your credences? Yes, I think in certain circumstances. Uh, uh, there's a fact something. about what like, the millionth and first oh, digit wow. in your credences. Do you think that? I'm an astronomer. All, all real values are within a value of two. So, the, the, the James circumstance in which you apply the principle of, of indifference, and let's lose that label if we want to. Yeah, it's precisely that I have background information. I have uh, propositions, a set of propositions that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. and the only difference with regard to the background information is the label I put on them. Other than that, they are totally symmetric states of, of knowledge. So for example, I find the coin on the road, um, and um, I don't look, and it's going to be flipped over there. I have background information that sideways can <coughs> come up. Other than that, there are labels on the sides, and don't even call it as a just call it A and B. Yeah. And as far as my situation is, um, my, my state of knowledge is completely symmetric if you just flip the labels. Yeah. It's right. A or B. What Jane says is in those circumstances, um, I, I apply. Uh, the principle of indifference, and I say my credence is a half. And all I mean by that is, that, what that statement means is, that um, it, it's not just, I, you know, I have no clue, and there are two things I have no clue about. As opposed to, I found a 6,000 sided die, and I'm in the same situation, I, I, I'm totally symmetric between the 6,000 side, and so if I give a probability of 1 over 6,000, what I'm saying is, I have no clue about 6,000 things, and uh, otherwise I'm symmetric. And that's also, if you might even want to say, okay, say that, don't do any betting on the basis of credence, but it does represent your state of, of what you don't know about the world. That's a state to be in. But Luke, I, I mean, I'm trying, I'm honestly trying to understand yeah, sure. what you have in mind. It, suppose we start in the situation you just gave. So we do what you just suggested, that is you set your credence to one and a half for A, Yep. And then, before it ever gets flipped, you do a very fine microscopic examination of the coin. You get all this more information. You, you, you check whether there are variations in the density. You sure. check the exact geometrical structure, blah, blah, blah. You find these perfect symmetries. Certainly after that, and knowing something about the flipping procedure, I would then after that recommend, as it were, you know, believing it's got equal odds coming up both sides. Everybody. But, my, but my, wait, my epistemic situation has clearly changed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and But as far as I can tell, all you've told, you're, you're saying, no, it's the same at the end. No, 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 no. Because the credence doesn't completely characterize an epistemic situation. Well, the, then you have to tell me more about how okay. you're thinking about this. I, I think it's the point Wayne was making, but I want to. 
there again, you confuse your credence of whether the guy is fair with your credence of what the outcome is going to be. We no, I was just talking about the. I, I was talking about my credence in the outcomes and how it changes on receipt of information okay. about. So I'm, so I'm going to modify the situation. You come across a coin with a sign above it that says weighted coin. Okay, so we know it's a weighted coin. Still, I, you would be a fool if you didn't place a bet to someone at 50-50 odds that's going to come heads because you don't know which way it's weighted. So no, I, if, if somebody came and offered me who knew about the coin and said, hey, when I take a bet that it comes heads? No, I would no, say, I but no, 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 there you're suspecting <laughs> of all of your votes. That ha there has to be a neutral part. You only have the sign that says it's weighted. You don't know which way it's weighted. Yes. And there's a neutral party who wants to bet on whether it's going to come heads. You mean the you neutral part she wants to get weighted in order to do know? Huh? Well, he, he doesn't know any more than you do. I don't know. So you mean right. a neutral party and equal dog? Say again? An equal dog. An equal dog. A guy who is as ignorant of the situation as you. Yes. You can toss the coin. I can toss the coin. So I don't understand. That, that, that's, that's, that's the only way to place that. You, you should be placing bets with people who are in an unfair advantage. You should be placing bets with people who are in a situation. So, so, uh, so, so that's why I'm trying to distinguish. You, you have a credence about whether it's a weighted coin. You know, you're pretty sure it's a weighted coin. That's the same thing you credence about what the outcome is going to be. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. I, I, I really think you're missing the situation here. No. You say you shouldn't bet with people with unfair advantage. Yeah. Casino owners. You should bet no, yeah. you should bet so No, you should. should. No, if they're regulated. <laughs> if what? They, you should if they're regulated and people have checked. There's still the only no, the no. Device. Of course you should. No, it's always. It's and always get into a situation where you say you can't be cheap. Sorry. That, that, no, no, that's really, answer this question. You get into a situation from a lot of knowledge, not a lot of ignorance, <laughs> where you say it is physically impossible for them to be cheating. That's fine, but okay, that's, that's fine. That, that, that's fine, fine, but that's not the scenario I'm talking about. Like, because again, no, it's you're, 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 you're focused too much. Okay. You focus too much on wanting knowledge about whether or not this thing is fair, and I'm saying that's that's not the knowledge at issue. The, the knowledge at issue is what the outcome of the flip is going to be, and the way to determine that is to use the principle of the difference of the background knowledge I have doesn't allow me to gain any more information about this outcome of this one. I, I, I am ignorant, so I decide. If I'm sufficiently ignorant, I just don't form a belief. Well, but then, you know, well, but then you're missing out on bets that can make you rich. If you're doing that, you're living like this. I'm missing out on bets that can bankrupt me, too. So I do it. But that's not So at this point, more than 10 years ago, I wrote a paper on how I thought people should think about the probability of statistical mechanics. Send it to a journal, and the referee reports convinced me that I couldn't write a paper on this. I had to write a book. <laughs> and if anyone's interested in the um, draft of that book, it's, 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 it's there. And um, I think it's just illustrating the fact that you, that you just, you, you, there's just so much to cover before you can get started. But let me just say, say I think that. Um, I'm sorry, but I think I can hear you. Luke. Luke, yeah. I agree with a lot of what Luke says and a lot of what uh, Tim says. <laughs> um, in particular, <laughs> it's only under certain circumstances does it make sense to ascribe relatively precise credences to, pe to, to, to people. And this is something that uh, Stasic and I gave good thought about a lot. Like, you know, what he said is, um, well, it would be a joke to say that and he, he was actually interested in making recommendations of weather forecasters and things like that. It would be a joke to say that you're creating, your, your degree of belief that's going to range more is 0.5, 69, 7, 4, 2, 3, yeah. whatever, right, right. So we want to have, but in some circumstances, you have lots of grounds for, 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 for having a credence within, you know, within a certain range, and other th situations, you, have, you, you just literally have no clue. And I think we need, when you just said this, there's a lot more to a, a belief statement than the sign of credences. And one way to handle it, I'm not saying this is the only way, Good's recommendation is say, well, okay, there's a, a, a credal set. Your belief state is actually um, not, not a precise credence, but some kind of set of credence. Now that is, let me get to it. But that's, Making there's a if that's set as precise boundaries, that's another artificial uh, uh, precisification. So you might have degrees of reasonableness. 
But then, if there's a precise degree of reasonableness, then that's a physics. So there's this hierarchy. And well, how far do you go up the hierarchy? He says, well, you go as far uh, 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 until the, um, the utility of, um, of, of, of going further becomes negative. He has a certain point, it's not going to make much of a difference. So in circumstances, it's fine to pretend you've got precise increases. In other circumstances, you want to say, no, here's a range of things that I regard as reasonable, et cetera. And I actually think that that's not a bad way to think about how we're going to represent creative state. Now you can ask. Is that about good? Good has a paper in which he calculates that there are. I don't remember exactly, but it, is, it was an exact number. Something like 5,836 kinds of patients. 46,656. <laughs> 46, you know, the chance that a particular one is one over those. Right, yeah. right. So yeah, okay. um, I think there's a way to decode that within right. this approach. And mm -hmm. that these two circumstances, I found the calling out, I totally right. analyzed everything. The difference in that comes not in the credence of what is the probability of the next one will be pairs. Those look the same, and so you're worried that it's the same state, but it's clearly not the same state of knowledge. Now I ask, what's the probability of head 10 heads in a row? And that one I'm going a half to the power of 10, and this one I've got a lot more thinking to do about how I update as the new information comes in. And so in, in, in the, the set of things that you need to your credence about the situation, remember it's a function, right? You're supposed to stick a proposition in and out comes a you know, idea. Um, the difference in, in the state is not in the credence it assigns to a single function, but in what it assigns to a whole range of, of things. And that's where the difference in the two, the, the two you know, mental states or whatever, it, it states of information, knowledge, comes in. Also, I'm not committed to the statement that every, every proposition given some other proposition, has a credence. Right. So there are some times where I'll, I'll, I'm happy to join Dave in going, what part of I have no clue. Right, exactly, yeah. So I just think, yeah. I think James has set out the circumstances in which this is reasonable. And, and I think those are good. And, and, and yeah, I, I think saying the garbage says, you know, there are situations you couldn't tell, but that, I'll, I'll leave that. Maybe Luke can remind me about James, I haven't read in a long time. But he has some very impressive examples in which he puts down some constraints, uses his mathematical principle, and gets the right frequencies. But when he doesn't get the right frequencies, what he says is, I just have to put down the right constraints. Oh, I that, makes, that makes it sound pretty analytical. <laughs> <but, laughs> I don't know. Heads by wind, tails you lose. That's the right way to <laughs> He's very nice. No, I'd have to watch the show. Dustin got us into this. We'll discuss it. Want to start another one? I apologize. <laughs> no, no, this is good. This is important to talk about. Um, I had a question for David, if I may. So, we suppose we have a fair, a fair dive in the sense of it's a perfect uh, cube and weight distribution. And we know, as an empirical fact, that um, the relative frequency all possible outcomes is approximately one six, sort of reflecting the symmetry. Right. Don't you think there, there's some sort of physical explanation of the relative frequencies in which this physical symmetry of the die will play an important role? Do you I do. This? I do, but I, but I don't think I don't think the exponent. Am I getting that right? The exponent is the thing that you explain, right? Yes. That's the right thing yes. that which is to be explained. Good, good. So, yes, I agree that it can, can play an important role. I, I can't see, just as a matter of logic, how the exponents could be limited to that. Or indeed, that's the limited that's, to, that's any, the to any set of non explicitly probabilistic claims. <laughs> Yes, I, I agree. It will play an important role. I mean, what kind of role will it play? Suppose you have some probability distribution over the initial microstates of, of the universe, OK? Um, um, then, you know, the, the, the way you're going to play this out by means of a very complicated calculation, yes, the uniformly weightedness of the die is going to play a, a crucial role. 
with it, but it's not, if, if what you mean by playing an important role is it or other non-probabilistic information like it will suffice to entail the probability, no. So do you have to use no probabilities in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, yeah. 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 But at some point, these physical symmetries could amount to something that would guide a rational prior about what the objective physical probability. I mean, I think that I, you know, I, 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 I mean, we've had this conversation so many hundreds of times that I'm embarrassed to. But I haven't had it with you. <laughs> you're, you're too young for that. Um, um, but, but look. Um, um, Yes, of course, the, the intuitive pull is very strong. That's because we've internalized over geological ages since we were slime on rocks, okay? Um, certain features, certain salient features of what the actual probability distribution say over initial microstates of the universe is or what the implications of that probability di distribution are for various typical specialized cases. So of course the intuitive pull is very strong. You might even want to say, but this is just a question of semantics, that somebody who hasn't internalized these probabilities is not a reasonable person um, um, or something like that. But if you want to be clear about the, the foundations of the situation, if you want to be clear about how the reasoning goes, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued that Tim thought this was a bad way of setting up the question. That's definitely the form that the question takes in my mind. Okay, you've got a bunch of claims about the uniformity of the weight distribution, about uh, how it's going to be flipped, um, macroscopically speaking, so on and so forth. Um, you know that the right thing to do is to get from there to a one-sixth probability. Okay, um, you know that what you've written down so far doesn't have any logical entailment about probabilities. The word probability hasn't been mentioned yet, okay? Um, and now it seems to me there is a great divide for this is how I'm envisioning it in my head. Um, Tim thinks this is a bad way to set it up, so here's a psychological confession. Yeah, this is how I set it up in my head. At that point, there is this gap that still has to be bridged, logically speaking. Okay, and the big question is whether what bridges the gap is some kind of a priori principle of reasoning or it's further empirical information. Okay, um, that's how I think about it, and whenever I think about it like that, I say to myself, how can it be an a priori principle of reasoning that bridges that gap? Of course it's further empirical information. And if you say, and, and if you say, but gee, it's felt so compelling to so many people, I can say, yes, I've got a diagnosis of that. This has been hardwired into us for a long, long time. Okay. So, so David, helpfully, for those of you who haven't been treated to this for 20 years, <laughs> I, I think accurately summarized, I mean really accurately summarized the way he thinks about it and why he thinks other approaches can't be right. right. He's just got this intuition that there must be something wrong. But if we state the opposing view, so the opposing view says, no, it's not, it, 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 it's not, uh, I'm going to start with no probabilities. Okay? I'm going to start with a dynamics, fundamental dynamics which, quite honestly, is not programmed into the slime. Uh, various aspects of it, sir. No, the dynamics itself is not, and that's what I'm going to need to do the calculation of it. I'm going to start with... No, we don't have to disagree about that. Yeah. Anyway, okay. yeah. Start that's with the fundamental dynamics. Right. I have positive information about symmetries. Right. Uh, I, I then model the situation, but because the actual situation is microscopically precise and the model is merely macroscopically precise, there are many microscopic realizations of it. I then run a typicality argument, which does not involve the word probability anywhere, that says uh, 
if I were to repeat this process, and I do an analysis of repeating this process, repeating the throw many, many times, that a typical frequency would be, say, a sixth, from which at that point the symmetries come in in a big way if you put a load the dots. Just as they do the typical frequency. Yeah, yeah. The typical, yeah. the typical probability. Right. Right. And then you say, I haven't mentioned probability yet. The, the typical frequencies will be a sixth. And at that point, if you ask me, well, what should I think about an individual throw? I might say, I don't, I don't know what to tell you about an individual throw. Or I might say, eh, make it a sixth. Why? Because the typical long-term frequencies are a sixth. And that's it. And I didn't mention probability. Anymore. Yes, you mentioned okay. typicality. No, um, I didn't mention probability. I, I mentioned typicality. Mention typicality. Which is not probability. I'm I, I introducing another word. It, it, yeah. yeah, it's, it's what, what we what some of us have been struggling to understand relative to the natural for a measure. long time. Okay, the right. relative to the natural and measure. And this is why. And the natural measure is, is, is in terms of canonical variables and layers. Why is that What's relative? natural about that? Yeah, don't tell me what, why it's natural. What makes why it is natural it relevant? Relevant? dynamics? What makes it relevant? Preserved under the dynamics. What makes it relevant to calculate? Wait, wait. Yeah. Well, you said do it without probability. No, I I'm doing it without no. probability. No, I didn't another complaint. I know, Tim. Even if nothing existed, you'd still complain. <laughs> <laughs> That's not your <laughs> job. <laughs> it's not to say that you need to tell someone else. <laughs> Have the argument, but I right. you you made I think an eloquent and clear Good. statement of what's bothering you at the back of my mind. Good. I try to make a clear statement about why I think your worry doesn't come up. If Good. You Good. 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 Okay. Can, it, do you need to give an argument that some sort of account of when is when is enough empirical information enough? What do you mean? So like you you want to go and tell me. Yeah. Right. You don't mean that. I don't. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Like, you don't. I, enough, enough to reasonably bet. I know. I think I have to have a fully satisfactory understanding. Yeah. I want. I want. I want a set of. of uh, uh, I want a set of things that logically entail that the probability is such and such, or that I ought to, or 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 whatever equivalent. Well, you're never going to get that. Yeah, you, no, 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 no. You can point out what the side of the road. What do you do? This is this is a you know. I keep having to revert to phrases like this the last couple of days. This is obviously a regulative ideal of the scientific project, rather than a realized one. Okay, but here's a situation where things are very clear. Okay, everybody acknowledges. Okay, that the information about the uh, weightedness of the dice and the information about the macroscopic facts about how we're going to throw it and so on and so forth don't logically entail anything about either probabilities or the relative frequencies that should, you know, that, that, that are going to emerge or anything of the sort. Okay? So here we've got a clean logical situation. Okay? So we notice that we typically do make inferences from that information to relative frequencies or probabilities or whatever. Okay? And so we've got a clean logical situation where we can say, ah, there's a logical gap here. Okay? What do we what do we think fills it? Okay? And there there seems to me to be a great divide between people who say what fills it is some further piece of empirical information, some further empirical law, okay? Or um, not, okay? Or something else, okay? Which I'm referring to just because it's not that as something a priori. Yeah, but this is, sorry, again, this is really unfair. But I brought in the notion of the natural man. I, it but, clearly lies on the empirical side of that divide. No, right? no, no. No, no, but just, just yes or no. Does that does that information that a certain measure is a natural measure? Right. Does, how it's related to the dynamics? Does it complete it does the logical entanglement? Does, does it complete the, the logical entanglement? Answer the question. Does it fall on the empirical side yes. of the divide? Does it complete the logical? No. Does it, it complete the, my argument? Does it complete the logical entanglement? It completes my argument. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And my argument is that that's all you need to no, 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 Good. Uh, we, so we, I'm, not, I'm not going to God to give me something I'm like that. Sorry, I still don't. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm more confused. That's okay. Neither do we. 
Okay, I, I still don't, so we, we have a situation of a coin is picked up off the road, I'm willing to go 50-50, Tim wants some more information, sounds like you wanted some more information as well before you start accepting any bets, and what you were saying was I need more empirical information because I don't want to bridge the gap. Where you were, you, I, I was happy to jump all the way to 50-50, you saying right. no, that's, all, that's a logical jump, don't do that, yeah. do, do more empirical. So, and, I mean, like, literally, if it happened today, what oh, no. do you want? If, if, I, I know what, if it happened today, I would proceed exactly as Tim recommends, okay? If, uh, if the guy is, you know, if the guy looks, you know, if, if the guy <laughs> says it in an accent, uh, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to accept the bet? <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, Tim said that, by the way, and I leaned over to Barry and said, this is anti-Semitism. <laughs> In a certain, you know, in a certain disreputable kind of accent, wouldn't you like to accept the bet? I just say, see you later. Is it, is it enough? You, right? you want enough details that you can ask the mentalists or something? No, I mean, I, I don't understand the right answer. You know, you know the, 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 you want to know what the chances are? When do you take the bet? I, 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 the, the way any normal person would. I, 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 I <laughs> we clearly should not take it and lose all my money. <laughs> no, 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 I need you to win my money. I don't believe that if a guy asked you to accept the bet in that suspicious accent that Tim was using, if I get to choose, choose, you would accept. If I get to choose the side, I'm through the point. But what if it's what if it's you know, what if it's pizza or beer? Yeah. So, what do you do then? It's what. If it's pizza or beer, it doesn't have to be a bet about money. It's a, this what is what everyone does. Well, what should we do today? Pizza or beer? Toss a coin. Mm -hmm. Every, yeah. Everyone assumes it's 50 50. That's what people do. They yeah, do. No, no, no. I think that's right because most coins, it, you know, you really don't expect people to be carrying around waiting for coins. Well, Tim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Tim has made it clear that he has different perplexities. <laughs> But but uh, uh, I, I I don't yeah I would I would I would I would not do, do you make the case? if somebody says I, I have no idea somebody says I've got a coin in my pocket you know what 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 do you want or I've got a coin in my hand what do you want to bet that it's heads or tails um, um, I'm going to say I have no clue I have no information and and uh, uh, I, you know. There's no rational argument for me to, to take a bet like that. Right. I'm going to be suspicious of the guy. Oh, that's I mean, I'm not sure that the question was. was is being being right. Right. And, and the question is, you, though I made too big of a logical leap. How much, what, where is. Wait, there, there are really different questions here. There's a question of. Um, of what it would be reasonable for me to do under everyday circumstances. And there is a question of really following out to the end questions about what we're talking about when we talk about statistical mechanical probabilities and where those probabilities come from and trying to understand the status of those probabilities sure. at the most fundamental level. And I'm getting mixed up when you when you swoosh these questions together. Oh, sure. In, in the I, way I'm that not you saying that, oh, that what I've said is what you stick your head into Gibbs and then, hey, presto, stat neck, we're going right. off. That's right. not what you do. Right. So I'm, I'm on board with. Right. With so, I mean, I, my convictions here, and I think the differences between Tim and I here are only about the second issue, not about what it would be reasonable to do. Um, um, in everyday circumstances. Um, but the hand thing. So, you know, just the point that like, you, sh you shifted the conversation more towards figuring out what the objective probability is rather than how you should calculate your own subjective treaties. Because when you're talking about what the probability is that's coming to heads in statistical hand, it's like that's yeah. more talking about like an objective feature of the theory. Yes, yes. This, this, Conversation started with E.T. E. James, which E.T. James is well, a Well, no, no, no. So it started with, I thought you never got a good answer to your initial question. Okay. Which is, you say, 
you, 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 you asked it in an interesting way. Okay. You said, what's wrong with, is there something wrong with, uh, uh, with using the principle of indifference? Would I get the wrong answers? No, I said, would I be led astray? What? I said, would I be led astray if I used it? Uh, you mean led astray conceptually or led astray in terms of your betting behavior? I mean, credence is, is not, or not, it's not a fact about the world, it's only a fact about myself. So right. it can only be led astray about my betting behavior. Okay, so look, so then my answer is going to be yes and no. That is, yes, there's something <laughs> deeply wrong with it, okay? But in things like statistical mechanics, you might say, God played a weird joke on us, okay? Here's the, here's the deal, okay? Um, um, it turns out that the probability distribution that empirically succeeds is the simplest one you could imagine, okay? Uniform. Over the over the microstates compatible with the macrostate. I mean, of course, there are probably many others that would succeed equally well. Um, but that's one that that does succeed, and it's incredibly simple. Okay, and there might have been a tendency to say, "Shit, I would have thought of that myself." Okay, that's that's the first answer I would have given if you woke me up in the middle of the night. Okay, so you and indeed, like I've said. These things have been programmed into you. You that they seem profoundly intuitive to you, okay. so on. So this might encourage the idea, okay, that you have a feeling a priori that is prior to experience about what the right probability distribution is under such circumstances. Claim it's it, it, it's true that we feel that way. It's clear why we would feel that way. But of course, or. In my opinion, of course, it's false. It's an empirical claim about how the world is. I'm fine. I mean, yeah, most things are not up here. It's been hard to find actual right. up here states. Right. The, but he said he said it's garbage. He said Wayne Wayne gave a couple of things. Right. But I mean, the, the question whether it's garbage isn't the question whether it's up here or empirical. It's a question of if you use this principle in your life, will will you constantly be? No, no, no. Those are two separate questions. The thing could be garbage as a route to understanding what's going on. Right. But something that will not in a practical way lead you astray. But something that, will, are only that in fact not. will do no harm. Okay. But treatises are only practical. They're not they're not they're not yeah. they're not statements about the world. They're okay. statements okay. about how no, you're no, going no, to use it. That's 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 fine. Yeah. Um, 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 that's fine. Okay. Can I read just are we all your signature just walk out. We analyze the bet. The bet with the, 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 the about the, the three points in the coin. So, if if you give me A, B, and C, and say bet on one of them, then it, it, I, I, the, the sort of James rule, I just, those are symmetric in my head. I've put yeah. the labels. However, when you say, um, will you bet on B? You. You've now, it is now an asymmetry. You want me to bet on B. And that's what makes the bet that it will land on the side. It's now asymmetric. Now I shouldn't apply the principle of indifference. Now I shouldn't bet. Or I should start to do a what, what, what I'll do. Right I, I, I mean, you know, I'm just, I, I, and I don't want to rehash it. I'm just puzzled. Somebody comes up to me and says, something's going to happen. There are three possible outcomes, A, B, and C. What do you think the odds are? Or you know, how right. on that, what yeah. what would you consider fair odds, or right. right. what odds would you take a bet? And I, you know, my answer is just David's answer. And you agreed in other circumstances. What the hell do I know? I don't know anything. It's true. My my ignorance, being total and complete, is also symmetric. Right. Um, but that symmetry does me no good. Right. Knowing the actual concrete symmetry of the die. That's positive information. Sure. And, and that, that's the only distinction I was trying to make. So, I, and again, I don't want to carry this on. Yeah. I know you've had your hands yeah. up right forever, and I was, I, maybe you could make this the last comment. Okay, well, I mean, I think that there are just, and I think you guys were just basically talking about this, but I think there are kind of two separate questions at issue here. When we say the principle of indifference is garbage, we could mean one of two things. We could either mean that it's, um, illogical to state it as an a priori claim, and I think most people here agree with that. I don't know if there's anyone who actually wants to say that the principle of difference is something we all ought to adopt for rational credences or whatever. And I think there's a separate thing that we were just talking about, about um, 
whether as a practical matter, if you choose to adopt the principle of indifference, will you be made destitute by right. a series of bets? Right. And I think um, the answer to that, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think the answer to that is no. Yeah. If we accept also the, the idea of adverse selection, where if someone is making a bet with me, then that is information that that's right. a bad bet right. for me. Good. Good. And so if we're looking at this like red or green light box, on the side of the road, Luke may choose to make this bet. I don't think that that's a negative expected value bet. I think that's a zero EV bet. I think maybe Tim would not make that bet, and I think ultimately there's nothing at stake there because it's a zero EV bet. Oh, well, but it would depend on what it really costs. Yeah. 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 It'll cost you a dollar to play. If you, you, get, you get to guess, and the choice will be made before you guess, and you'll get a million bucks if you guess correctly. Right, so it depends, yeah, it depends if, on what, what the... If you don't take that, that you're sure, but, but I did describe that. That is that, that situation renders your credence about what the state is irrelevant. You're just saying you have 50% chance of guessing right. Uh, what's it? You, you're, you're, of course, if I get a million dollars if I guess right, and there are only two possibilities, that if I flip a coin and I, I there's a fifty percent chance that the coin will, will, will be right. I have a fifty percent chance of winning. But that has nothing to do with having a credence about what's underneath there. Zero to do with it. But I, uh, I, then, then I don't understand what you think credence is doing. I have no if you ask me it, how it, it, likely it's it, it, it's A, I'm gonna say I don't know how likely it's A. I don't what I know is that I'm flipping a coin, I have a fifty percent chance that it, that the coin is gonna come up to match this has nothing to do with assigning a freeze to A and B. Zero. But of course I'll take that bet. Okay, let me put it another way. Suppose you suppose you initially right. Suppose you initially regard A as a lot more likely than B. But suppose you do have credences and they're 0.99 and 0.1. Right? And then Tim so rest of your own advice is you prefer a bet on A to B, right? And Tim says, no, don't do that. Flip a, flip, 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 right. flip a coin and choose depending on the other right. coin. Given those credences that you started with, what's your, what's your expect, what, 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 what's your expectation value for getting the right one? And the answer is one the credence is washed out. It, it's, it's one half. Right. What? It doesn't and matter I, what I don't think I understood the setup, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you, okay, so one of A or B is the right answer. Yeah. Let's suppose you have certain credences in A and certain credences in B. Right? Yeah. Right? Now, now flip a coin and, and say I'm going to choose A if the coin comes up heads and choose B if the coin comes up tails. Use your credences you started with to now calculate the probability that you're going to make the right choice. Right. It's 50. And yeah. whatever those cre credences are, the, the, the answer is 50-50. Yeah. What on earth does that initial credence mean? It's your degree of belief in the truth that A is the right one or B is the right one. Yeah. So if you have those credences, if you have a choice between making a free choice and constrained by a coin, you ought to make your free choice. But now Tim says, well, suppose I'm not going to make a free choice, I'm going to constrain my choice to be whatever the coin comes right. from. Yeah. If that's your procedure, if you use your initial credences to calculate the probability that that procedure will get the right one, the answer will be one, right. one half, right. assuming the yeah, well, right. it'll be one. It'll be a half no matter what your initial credences right. were. Your initial yeah. credences are they relevant to your judgment that you have a 50% chance of winning a million dollars. Because yeah, I'll, give you, I'll give you a dollar for a I mean, put it, put it this way. All right. So you have initial credence in, in A and initial credence in B. Yeah. Your credence that Tim's procedure will get the right one is a weighted average of your credence if it's A. Okay, yeah, I think that's it. And, right. So it's a weighted average of one half and one half where the weights are your initial credences. Right. So it comes out to be So it comes out to be Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, your, your credence is washed out. Excellent. I think this is a good place to end. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much.